When I was in high school, probably around ninth or tenth grade, my best friend had a boyfriend that was older and lived fairly far away. So he was not from our school or anything. Not sure how they met. When we would spend the night at my house, or we would go to the mall or to see a movie, he would often stalk us. We would be in my house and he would drive by slowly. Keep in mind he lived nowhere near there, so it was no accident. This was while they were dating. I think he wanted to check up to make sure she wasn't cheating or something. He would look to see if my car was at my house, etc. One time we were at an amusement park that was local and he just happened to show up there. My friend, bless her heart, was kind of dumb and naive. So she honestly thought it was some happy accident. He showed up there while we were there. Obviously, I knew this was intentional. It was pretty annoying that she and I could do nothing without him showing up or following us. I used to talk to him and he told me he wanted to poke holes in their contraception so that he could get her pregnant so she wouldn't leave him. I told her what he said and she still carried on sleeping with him. Finally, she got some sense and decided she wanted to break up. Well, that did not go well. She had a grandmother and was elderly in the early stages of dementia at the time, lived alone, but only a few minutes from my friend so they could keep an eye on her and take care of her. Well, apparently, the crazy boyfriend began visiting the elderly grandmother regularly on his own. No one knew he was doing this since she was just a confused old woman. He was saying all kinds of things to her to try and manipulate her. It worked to the point that the grandmother thought he was a great guy and that my friend and her mom and stepdad were awful for treating him badly. The grandmother had some kind of episode where she was yelling at my friend's parents about everything. It got to the point where they had to take out a restraining order so that the guy could no longer approach her or the grandmother. I'm not a scaredy cat, but I was getting a little nervous myself because he did know where I lived and he knew I was probably one of the ones encouraging her to break up with him and I worried he may retaliate. But lucky for everyone involved, he took the hint and stayed away. But that is truly a shady tactic to manipulate an innocent old woman with dementia into turning her own daughter and granddaughter and confusing the poor old woman. What a piece of work. Yesterday, my dad was all excited to finally buy this gorgeous one-story brick house in Indigo Lake, Texas. It was so elegant, refined, copious amounts of land to run around, a vista of Sylvian charm. No annoying neighbors, unless they were on the road. We brought all of our belongings and finally came face to face with what was going to be a beautiful nightmare. As we unpacked and arriving at the steps, immediately, strange things started to happen. The protected door opened by itself, and even the grand door that led inside the house as well, just creaked loudly, as if it were telling us to go inside. My dad thought carpenters were working there as it was still being worked on, but only a day or two to finally complete it. My brothers exchanged confused glances and noticed the back of the house had this weird looking pond. Behind it was a vast forest that had this sort of small cavern slash grotto, which made absolutely no sense. We were wrapped in complete forest, so it was pretty creepy. We stepped inside, ignoring the doors opening and were completely astonished with how beautiful the house was. I still remember being seven years old and in awe, with so many things the previous owner left. It was like going back in time. Exquisite paintings, china vases, samurai swords, a chimney with a moose taxidermy above it. Oh my gosh, it was beautiful. To the right, as soon as you walk in, was the kitchen and a strip down that led to the washing machines as well as the backyard. To the left of the living room was a fork. On the right side was gonna be my parents' room. Straight led to a grand room, which we named an arcade room. It was a long hallway to get to the arcade room, 
and left of it led to another hallway. But what was odd of this was that there was a small shower and toilet, along with a long mirror that coated the wall and led to a door which was my brother's room in a closet. That made no sense. From my brother's room, it led you back to the fork living room and the restroom was in the middle. The arcade room was so cold. Even during summer, when you opened the windows, it was still freezing. Everyone who came would complain about how cold it was. I thought it was just a small draft. We had a foosball table, PlayStation system, video games, mini movie theater, and even a gym in that arcade room. Night falls, and my dad buys the Blair Witch Project. Yep, scared the hell out of me. We were taking care of my uncle's sweet chihuahua named Brandy, who out of nowhere began barking furiously at the wall in the kitchen. She had all her hairs standing up on a foamy mouth by how angry she was. I grabbed her and put her in the washing room where she just whined. My dad was dismissive of the idea that we were living in a haunted house, but that night after the movie ending was something I'm never gonna forget as this presence started immediately to show itself. I made the decision to sleep in my parents' room for a while. In that room was a painting of a boy and a girl on a countryside walk on a road next to a man who was behind. I'm getting chills just being reminded of this painting. My brother is snoring in his room and my parents are awake and we begin to hear loud furniture swinging and rustling across. The nails are scratching the walls and these sort of chain noises are coming from the attic with a ch ch as if someone was calling a dog. Right then and there, man, my heart sunk and I knew this place was haunted. My dad gets up and knocks on my brother's door, thinking he moved things, but He's fast asleep. The noises were brushed off, just a raccoon outside or the forest trees swinging due to the wind. My heart is racing and constantly thinking of the Blair Witch Project, which made it worse thinking it was real. Because you know, at the time, internet wasn't a popular thing to see if a movie was fake. I left a small nightlight on and it was probably 11 or midnight when my parents fell asleep. As the night pressed, I dozed and woke up. My parents were sound asleep. The door of their room is completely open and vividly remembered we locked it. My heart is racing as I know something is really wrong. At the foot of my bed, the end is sunken down as if someone was sitting on it and I felt it sink down. You guys, I felt it and I was about to pass out and throw up. When suddenly the covers of my bed toss and I immediately felt these hands and fingernails tickle my feet. I get chills remembering it. I kicked back whatever it was and could feel the hairs on these hands, just massive hairy hands and arms. I yelled. I got up from a nest of blankets and somehow jumped straight into my parents' bed crying. My parents console me. Dad gets up, turns the light on and I'm done. Right there and then I'm crying in my mum's shoulder that I don't want to live here anymore. After consoling, my dad and mum are somewhat wanting to believe me, but they can't. That night I slept in between them. I didn't sleep my eyes were glued to the door, waiting for it to open. Next day comes, and my brother is working out in the arcade room as he plays varsity football in high school. He comes rushing to us, saying he saw little girl's feet with frilly socks on near the hallway with a lengthy mirror. My dad doesn't believe it, but he becomes a believer eventually. I'm gonna go ahead to share the experiences that happened after. A few nights later, my father is in the bathroom. He had a habit of urinating sitting down at night so that no one gets interrupted sleep. From the windows, the moon is able to reflect some light that gallantly pierces through. 
As my dad is urinating, he notices my mum is at the door and says he will be done shortly. So he does his thing and right as soon as he's about to pat my mum on the back to let her go, my dad goes right through her, the silhouette, I mean, and he falls over. That night is the one I remember he finally became a believer and shouting at us to come out and turns on all the lights. He was as pale as a ghost, but I was relieved that I wasn't crazy. Water always turned on as well. Bath water, even the shower, where the long mirror hallway was. One time after a party finished and everyone went home, I took a long bath with my action figures and had a huge curtain that covered it. My mum sometimes would use the bathroom whenever I showered. So I heard her walk in and notice the shadow pass and would just say, hey mum, no response. So whatever, off I played and upon finishing the bath, the bathroom door was wide open. I came out telling my mum why she didn't close the door and she said that she didn't use the bathroom and was outside cleaning up. It was scary. A lot of stuff went on in that house. We had family friends stay the night to look over the house while we went on a trip. That following night, they called us saying they were leaving as they were getting too spooked. The couple kept having dreams of a handsome man with hairy hands touching them and he would laugh a lot. And his wife said that the painting in my parents' room was moving. She noticed the kids in the painting moving and the television in that room turned on and the volume would flood up so high to the max. They left in the middle of the night after a mere few hours. We were all painting the fence of the house and saw neighbors jogging on the road. They approached us and told us the house had belonged to an artist who ended his life in our garage. No one ever got close to him as he was always reserved and spoke to no one. But joggers would see him with art supplies all the time. No one ever knew who the girl that my brother saw was. Right then and there, my mom called her, who was a spiritual person and told her to take incense and just walk around and talk kindly to the man and ask him to leave. After the small ritual, we never felt anything. Looking back, it feels odd to have been scared. Maybe he was just really lonely and in a dark place at the time and was just playing with me, wanting his presence to be acknowledged. The carpenters even mentioned that they would see a girl roaming around our pond with this strange face scarf on. Funny thing is, my mum stayed at home while my dad worked and while my brother and I were in school. She never experienced or heard anything. Anyway, we ended up selling the house because it was flooding a lot. And the creepy part about the grotto in the back, near the farmer's pond, was that after coming back from evacuating the floods, we found so many dead animals stacked on top of each other. Dog, geese, cats, two horse and owls. It just gives me the shivers every day. The arcade room is still frozen cold as well. I haven't been back, but I would be more than happy to share the paintings that he had in the house, as all of his belongings are in storage. My father passed away when I was 15, in my freshman year of college. Me and my roommate in the dorms were somewhat close, but really had only known each other for over a month when the incident happened. I hadn't told her much about my childhood, but she knew that my father had passed away. One day she woke me up and asked, did your father used to call you Maisie? I hadn't heard that name since I was six or seven. I definitely never told her that he used to call me that, as it was a repressed memory that I had not thought about in a long time. Anyway, as it turned out, she had a dream that my father had come to her and asked her to take care of me, calling me Maisie, my childhood nickname. It was always difficult for me to think that my father never saw me graduate high school or start college. But I guess he did, from wherever he is now.
Back in 2004, I worked for a popular Canadian company that sold cell phones slash cable slash internet and stuff. I worked at a location in this city's local mall for a few years, and over the course of time I got to know and build rapport with the customers that I saw regularly. There was one customer in particular that I served at least once a month. He would buy a prepaid phone with cash every month without fail. As I rang him up the second or third time, I watched him open up his wallet and saw half inch thick watts of $100 bills. Then it clicked. Monthly burner phones, wads of hundos. He was a dealer, for sure. Now the guy was genuinely a nice dude, always polite, knew me by name, asked how my day was, and I enjoyed seeing him come in. I could tell you countless horror stories of the physical and verbal abuse that we endured at the hands of customers at that location. So it was really great to get to deal with a nice person. And the commission and bump in personal sales was always nice as well. One night, I was at home making dinner. I had the TV on in the background. My program had ended and the station switched to the six o'clock news. As I sat down in front of the TV with my food, the news station opened with a story on a murder that had happened in the city. Suddenly, my favorite customer's mugshot popped up, and I sat there mouth agape, listening to the details of the story. It blew my mind knowing that I had interacted with him every month for probably a solid year. He's actually out of jail now, got an early release and everything. And while I'm sure I'm not really at risk, I'd rather not meet him again. I worked at a local pizza joint in my small hometown back in 2016. About six months into the job, I had an older man around 70 years old come in. He walked up to the counter and had asked me for a soda. He then sat at a table. A few minutes later, he came back up to the counter and asked what my name was. I told him, as we didn't have name tags. I didn't think anything of it. And he walked back down to the table to sit down. Ten minutes go by and he came back up to the counter and said, What would you say if I were to ask you on a date? Immediately, I got a bad feeling. I uncomfortably laughed it off and told him no. He then left. A few hours later, I saw him walking back up to the pizza place. I told my co-worker that I was uncomfortable and that I didn't want to serve him. She agreed with me and I hid in the back while she spoke with him. After a few minutes, I came back and she told me what happened. She said he asked for me and she told him that no one named Courtney works here. And then he said, yes, she does. She's 5'3", has purple hair and she's off on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I'd never seen this guy before, but somehow he knew my work schedule. I immediately called my dad. He's an officer, and I wanted to see what I could do. There wasn't anything I could do, but avoid him whenever I was working. I had to let everyone know the situation and how uncomfortable I was. However, when he came in, they forced me to handle him. The next time he came in, he was telling me about his 18-year-old girlfriend in the Philippines. He then went to the restroom, and was banging around in there for at least an hour. And then he just left. I would occasionally look out the window to see what was going on outside. And I would see him in his car with a newspaper in front of his face, watching me. Everyone would tell him to leave me alone and that I was only 18. He didn't care. He would follow me around the grocery store, which was right next to the pizza place. I got used to all of this. Eventually, he put in a job application at the pizza place. I read the resume. In the experience section, there were a few normal things. However, the last few things sent shivers down my spine. He had listed janitorial experience and chainsaw experience. My coworkers and boss thought this was hilarious, so they put it on the wall. And whenever I couldn't perform up to their standards, they said they'd give him a call and give him the job. I soon left after that. So I'm not sure if he continued to try and chat with the other girls. A few months later, I started working at a rescue center. I was talking to a few co-workers and they brought this guy up. 
the exact same thing happened to one of them at the previous jobs. Some 70-year-old stalker. Creepy. My dad, Don Baker, was a character and a half, larger than life, a big man with enormous presence and a booming laugh, good-humoured and loquacious, until a switch was flicked. Somewhere and suddenly, he was angry and dangerous. He married my mother when I was six years old, and I came to know both sides of him very well. Those were the only two sides he seemed to have, until he told me this story when I was in my early twenties, and for the first time I saw him uncertain, pensive, and apparently moved by something profound that he didn't understand. Eager to get away from the confines of his small Minnesota hometown, and what he called his Norsky family, he lied about his age to join the army at seventeen, in 1938. Almost immediately he was attached to the OSS and sent to China in the aftermath of the invasion of Shanghai by Japan, where he was tasked with gathering intelligence about the growing bloodshed in the area. After Pearl Harbor, he spent the first two years of the war as a paratrooper in the South Pacific, until he sustained injuries so severe that he was sent back stateside for hospitalization. After a few months in the hospital, he was deemed well enough to be discharged, but not fit enough to return to action. So, he was attached to the 11th Airborne when it was activated at Camp Mackle in North Carolina. As one of a cadre of flyers and paratroopers who set up the division jump school, while there, he and some of his fellow paratroopers began devising strategies for paratrooper recon. And that brings me to the story he told me. During the Korean War, and long since reassigned to intelligence, he was one of an elite chalk who jumped behind enemy lines to gather information and bring it back to the front line. Because troop movements and skirmishing meant that the front was always changing. Return routes were constantly being redrawn, and sometimes not quickly enough. Many of the paratroopers in the regiment lost their lives because of this inherent danger. On the way back to the front and carrying extremely important information, my dad had made it from his recomposition to a spot along the route, about halfway home, when a brutal swarm swept in during the late afternoon, and he had to seek shelter. There was a cave on the route that was behind him. He had to backtrack a short way to it, and once there, he said he sort of had to hunker down and wait for the storm to pass. So he did what any soldier would do in that position. He grabbed some Z's. Sometime later, he was awoken by another member of his team who jumped a day or two before my dad. I can't remember his name, but he was one of my dad's good friends, Buddy. The storm continued to rage outside, but Buddy said he had to risk moving through it to quickly get to my dad, because near to the front, the route dad was on had been compromised. In the dim glow of the small flashlight, Buddy traced a map in the dirt of another route from the cave to the front that was as safe to follow as any such route is behind enemy lines in a shooting wall, and then clapped Dad on the back and said, you'll get yourself home in one piece. And then, saying he had something else to do, he ducked out of the cave and was gone. Dad said Buddy had probably spent no more than five minutes with him in that cave, most likely less, and he added that he really didn't think too much about it at the time. So Dad made it back out to the front without incident, in no more than a few days. Once he dropped off the intelligence, he hit the mess, and then his tent, and slept the deep sleep of the truly exhausted. When he awoke the next day and polished himself up, he went to the mess before going to his full debriefing and found a few more of his buddies having breakfast. They hailed him and told them how glad they were he made it back. 
He was a little taken by surprise at their enthusiasm and told them that they weren't going to shake him off anytime soon. They made small talk for a few minutes and then dad asked when Buddy had gotten in. The guys exchanged glances and one of them said, didn't make it bake. Dad perplexed, looked from one another and said, he went out again already? And then dad said, it was the guys on the team that looked confused. No, Don, one of them replied. Buddy never made it back from the last jump. At this point, my dad told me he'd begun to get angry. That can't be possible, he declared to the others. I came back after him on the new route, and if anything had happened to him, I'd have seen evidence of it, or a fight or confrontation or more activity. But the new route was clean as a whistle, so quit lying to me, goddammit. The other team members visibly stilled, he said, and the atmosphere was strained. After a few more tense moments, the guy who had been answering him leaned towards him and quietly but intently asked him, what new route bake? Flustered, irritated and feeling a growing sense of unease, dad responded, the new route that buddy came back to tell me about, the route by the South Pass? At that, dad said, the guys were completely stunned. The spokesman for the group, white-faced, shook his head. That can't be done, he answered. Four days ago, Buddy was killed on his way back from his last recon. He almost weighed it all the way back. One of our scouts was watching for him and saw the whole thing. The Reds went through his pockets and got the intelligence packet. Since that's where the maps are, including the route you were both taking, we thought you were a goner. That's the story. When he finished talking, he fixed me with a grim smile and said, Buddy was there in that cave with me. As real as you are right now, he was there. It was as if he was answering an argument from me, but of course he was talking to himself. And by the time he got to me, he was dead. Already. By a day at least. If he hadn't have come to stop me from following the same route to give me a new one, I'd be dead too. Sometimes I wonder if I dreamed at all. But damn it, the facts are the facts. I've got back by taking a route I didn't even know of until that night I spent in the cave. My mother used to tell me that when I was very young, I would talk to someone who I would call the lady. When she asked me about this lady, I would describe a kindly middle-aged woman who stood in the doorway between the living room and the kitchen and spoke to me. She never moved from the doorway. Of course, it freaked my parents out a bit, but they always figured that it was just an imaginary friend. But what kind of kid has a middle-aged lady as an imaginary friend who never moves from one spot? I don't remember anything about the lady, though. I do, however, remember a strange incident one night. I was reading comics after bedtime by the light that used to come into the room from the landing when I became aware of someone coming up the stairs. So I did what every kid does and pretended to be asleep, so I didn't get in trouble. But I kept a sneaky eye open so that I could return to my comic once the coast was clear. A person approached the top of the steps, paused and then came into my room. I could see it was a man and assumed it was my father checking on me. But rather than come forwards towards the bed, the man started pulling at an old nail up hatch in the ceiling. It gave two or three different pulls from different directions and then left the room. I was absolutely convinced that it had been my father, but not wanting to get in trouble, I didn't mention it for about a week, when my curiosity got the better of me. I asked him what he had been doing and why he had been pulling at the hatch. He had never been to my room at night, and certainly had no interest in an old and entirely unusual hatch, when there was a perfectly operational hatch to the same place in his own room. The last vaguely supernatural experience I ever experienced was many years later. I had been out for a few drinks with my friends, a regular occurrence which always ended up with a longer walk back to town, some three miles into the countryside. I had no torch and mobile phones weren't yet common enough for me to have one. The last half mile was through a wood 
with an old quarry to one side, which was always a little unsettling, as you could hear the screech of tortured metal in the wind, or an unseen animal rustling through the undergrowth. However, there were a pair of white dogs who lived on the other side of the woods, who would always join me as I walked past, and they accompanied me through the woods. And I was always grateful for having them with me, especially since they were so easy to see by the moonlight. Once we got there, to the other side of the woods, they would turn back and head home. Then one night they came bounding up to us as usual and walked with me right up until we got to the edge of the woods, at which point they stopped, pricked their ears towards the wood and ran away. Naturally quite a lot of poo came out, but since I had no choice but to go through the woods, I bailed on experiencing the journey as hard as possible by singing at the top of my own voice and moving as quickly as possible until I had cleared the woods and arrived home. But the strange bit was that I never saw those dogs again. I'm 23 now. This started when I was three or four. Everything that happened that night, I remember like it was yesterday. The memory so vivid and forever in my mind. The second floor of my house at the time was really just a small landing with three bedrooms and a bathroom off it. Immediately at the top and to your right was my bedroom. The bathroom adjacent to the stairs, then my sister's bedroom and my parents' bedroom. My mum would put my sister and I to bed at seven o'clock every night. I always had issues falling asleep as a kid, but would eventually drift off. My bedroom had a closet next to the door and next to that, two windows with a dresser sitting between them, with my bed pushed against the wall, foot end of the bed near the door. One night, not unlike any other, we're put to bed and I finally find sleep after a few hours of just lying there, only to wake up some hours later. It was about two or three in the morning. I rolled over to scan my room. I've always been afraid of the dark, so the room was lit up, and my nightlight was plugged in at the end of the bed. Standing in front of the window furthest from me, near the closet, I saw what I thought at the time was an angel, quite literally glittering gold in front of my eyes, standing at least seven feet tall, staring out the window. My movement must have grabbed its attention, because immediately its head turned to look at me. There were no facial features except for a strong defined jawline, though faceless. It wasn't like a freaky facelessness. At this point, I was more curious than afraid. Then it started to yell at me. It kept telling me to shut up. The yelling quickly turned to screaming and I freaked. I was one giant goosebump. And I got up from bed, opened my door and looked into the lit hallway. My parents always left that light on at night in case my sister or I needed something or got scared in the middle of the night. Almost in slow motion, I noticed the air felt too still. Something was off. Before I could process anything, I took one step forward and out of the bathroom shoots this thing. It gets right in front of my face screaming a blood-curdling scream that still echoes in my ear to the day. The face of this thing was just grey and sinister, eyes completely blacked out, skin cracked, no lips, just a black hollow hole with it, the screams coming from it, long black hair flying around as if there were a fan switched on behind it and I lost it. I screamed so loud, I swear the entire house shook. I barged into my parents' room, tears streaming uncontrollably down my face. My mum looked scared and confused. My dad, just terrified. I don't remember what happened after that. I'm sure I told my parents what happened and ended up sleeping with them for the next few weeks. Growing up, I asked my mum about that night, and she explained how I barged in crying, rambling off some story about an angel or something. Today, I don't know what it was. 
My dad, on the other hand, never said much about it, and instead started warning me to stay away from Ouija boards, and told me some freaky stories about things that had happened to him. As my parents divorced, growing up, things got worse with respect to what I was being exposed to. My dad would show me scary pop-up videos and play creepy music. I was six or seven at this point. Safe to say I hated going to my dad's because I thought whatever I'd seen that night was somehow connected to him. Eventually, my mom remarried. We moved and things were okay. Then I decided to stop seeing my dad completely for unrelated reasons as I was nine years old at this time. And that's when things started again. The air was ridiculously heavy all the time. I hated sleeping in my room. I always felt like there was something at the end of my bed just watching me. I tried to ignore it. For nine years, constantly living in fear, we moved out of that house to somewhere around the corner. And once my mum and stepdad divorced, that way we wouldn't have to switch schools as I was about to graduate high school and my sister still had one more year. I still had access to the house as my ex-stepdad still lived there. They were using my old bedroom for storage and always kept the blinds closed as I had while living there. One morning when everyone in my old house was at work, my friend and I decided to sesh in the garage quickly. We had the okay from the ex-stepdad so long as we weren't driving anywhere afterwards. We walked through the front door, through the foyer to the garage, and got settled. I could already feel the extra 10 pounds on my chest, and I really wanted to make this quick. I had previously spoken with my friend about what I was feeling in this house, as we had been friends for years at this point, but never gave her much context. Not even five minutes into the sesh, we heard the footsteps above the garage, i.e. my old bedroom. My entire body went cold. My friend immediately looked at me, and we waited for another second and heard them again. This time, like a stomp type running around the room. We said, screw it. Packed up and got the hell out of there. I locked up and walked down the driveway completely freaked, trying to push the thousands of thoughts running through my mind out my head. Then, my friend let out a tiny shriek. I turned back to immediately ask her what was wrong. They were doing some work. I thought she could have stepped on a rogue nail or something. But the horror was written on her face, and I looked up at the window but the blinds were closed. I asked her again what was up. She said for whatever reason, she felt like she needed to look up to my old bedroom. She said the blinds were open in the window looking down on us. And I quote her words, this thing with black hair and black eyes and cracked skin and just a hollow black hole for a mouth was staring down. She said it so fast, terror was oozing from every word she said. That's when she burst into tears. And so did I. I was too freaked out to tell her what happened when I was a kid, and I didn't want to scare her more. I suggested we get the hell out of there. Since then, nothing's happened. I recently traveled to Rome, specifically the Vatican, and got a blessed St. Michael pendant for extra measure, seeing as whatever it was followed me in silence throughout the years. The thing hasn't bothered me other than showing up in a very specific nightmare I've had every eight to 10 years since my first encounter. If this thing is still on my tail, I'll be due for a nightmare within the next year. I'm not one for believing in ghosts, but there was something in college that could not have been just a coincidence. The dorm room that I stayed at my second semester of sophomore year was the singles dorm room. It was one of the few dorms that you could room by yourself, but they were really tiny. Think like only a twin bed could fit there. Well, one day when I was walking back up to my room, there were these guys outside their own rooms. One of them were pretty shook up, and I overheard him saying that stuff kept falling off his shelves and the things are being slightly rearranged. I didn't think too much of it from then on, at least not until the following year. 
the year after I was hanging out with one of my friends, when he said he needed to pick up something from his room. So we went into his room and I realised that it was the same room the guy in the previous year stayed at. Before I could say anything, he told me that the room really freaked him out. He said he would be in bed with his girlfriend when all of a sudden he would hear a lady whispering, Levantate, which means get up in Spanish. He would mostly just hear gibberish from what I remember, and maybe some things would be misplaced. It didn't help when I told him about the previous person there, and there was no way that the two of them knew about each other. Yet, stuff happened in that small room. What makes it creepier is that supposedly the dorm room housed the clergy, as this was a Catholic university, so make of that what you will. But this is the only instance that I can logically explain. About two years ago, in the middle of 2017, I was in a really bad place mentally. I was just starting to recover from a crippling addiction, and I was finally beginning to get in a good place and staying sober. For some background, I just had my firstborn child. My boyfriend, our son and I were living with my dad in a rather large house. This was due in large part to finances. My small family and I couldn't afford to move out on our own yet, even though we knew we needed to get away from my dad's craziness as soon as possible. My boyfriend was in between jobs and he was applying everywhere, but didn't have a lot of luck. My dad, unfortunately, was still very active in his addiction and had a bad habit of allowing street walkers he seemingly randomly found to come and live with us. My dad invited a couple who we all call Sarah and Adam to live with us. They were also very active users and would often loudly fight as well as assault each other. We begged for them to stop, but our pleas fell on deaf ears, and I was afraid to call the police because of my young son. I knew they would call CPS, and that they would want to take my son away. I had a bad feeling about living with our Sarah and Adam. I begged my father on several occasions to make them leave and move, but he refused, because he was having an affair with Sarah, and wanted her to leave her boyfriend to be with him. I'm sure this caused many of their fights. My little family tried our best to stay to ourselves. We stayed in our one bedroom, thankfully. We had a full bathroom attached to it, so we didn't share it with anyone else. I would always even go so far as to keep our bedroom door locked when we weren't home. One morning, my boyfriend left early for a job interview at a local restaurant, leaving me and our child alone in our room. I stayed in the room with my baby, not leaving as I had everything I needed to care for him. Diapers, wipes, clothes, clean bottle, formula, crib and everything. Let me briefly explain the setup of our rooms. Our bedroom, as well as the couple's bedroom, were in the back of the house. Our bedroom came out to a long straight hallway, and at the end of the hallway were the couple's room. I would open the door and look straight out and easily see inside of their room because where they were staying, the door would often be open. Suddenly, I heard a scream from their room in the hallway outside the room. I step out. After making sure the baby was safely in his crib, I check what was going on. Sarah is hysterical and talking rapidly. I couldn't understand what she was saying, but I could make out there was something wrong with her boyfriend. Looking back on everything, she was probably high. I rushed down the hallway, past hysterical Sarah and into the bedroom. I don't know why I did this. I should have just taken my baby and left the house, but I guess instinct took over when I knew something was off. I see Adam is laying on the bed motionless and he's on his back. As soon as I see him, I know something's very wrong. His skin was a deep unnatural gray color and he was so still. I rushed over to the bedside and touched his chest. He was so cold. There was no warmth left within him. I placed my fingers under his nose to check if he was breathing. Nothing. Placed my fingers on his wrist to see if I could find a pulse. Nothing. I placed my head on his chest to see if I could hear a heartbeat or detect the rise and fall of a breathing chest, but there was nothing. No breathing, no pulse, and no heartbeat. There was just stillness. 
His body wasn't even trying anymore to produce even slow, ragged breaths. He was that far gone. He was dead. Looking back, I knew as soon as I saw him that he was gone, but I didn't want to believe it. I'd held out hope that he had merely passed out. The whole time I'm doing this, Sarah is running around me wildly screaming and crying. I can't remember if I told her to get my dad or if she called him on his own, or if he just heard the commotion and came to check. He was weird and calm the whole time, but I could remember my dad's reaction wrong maybe. To be honest, I don't remember a whole lot of his reaction. From the first time I saw Adam, my mind and memory were a blur. I then rushed back to my baby boy. I was terrified at this point. Maybe I was in the wrong, but in that moment I was more worried about my baby than Adam. I calmly gave my son to my brother, who happened to be visiting us, and was hiding in his room the whole time, somehow unaware. I quickly filled him in. I knew my brother was safe, as he has never done drugs in his life, so I felt comfortable leaving my son with him. I knew my baby would be safe. At this point, after making sure my son was not in any immediate danger, I knew what must be done. Even though I didn't want to call for help because I was afraid they'd take my child. Sarah is still running around screaming and crying, and my dad is just silently standing around. Perhaps he was in shock. And I tell Sarah to dial 911. I think I ended up making the call, and a short time later paramedics and police are swarming the house. They tried to resuscitate, but we all knew it was useless. He was gone from the moment I walked in, and had probably been gone for hours at that point. Eventually, CPS showed up, and my worst nightmare was realized. They took my baby. My poor boyfriend came back home from his job interview, which he got by the way, blindsided with ambulances and police in our yard. He had no idea what was happening as I didn't have time to call him and fill him in before he got home. They eventually ruled Adam's passing as an accidental overdose. I don't know for sure if it was accidental because Adam had talked before about how unhappy he was and wanted to leave Sarah because he knew she was cheating on him, but he had nowhere else to go. I don't know, maybe I'm reading too far into it. I didn't know him very well, and we certainly weren't friends. The story doesn't have a happy ending. I'm truly sorry that Adam lost his life to the disease of addiction, but I couldn't help but be angry with Adam and myself. I'm angry for what he did, accident or not. I don't know if it's right or wrong of me, but I'm also angry with me. I feel like I could have done things a lot differently if I hadn't been struggling with addiction myself, and they may not have taken my son. I'm still sober, and my boyfriend and I are married now, and we're fighting our state for custody of our son, and we will keep doing so until he is home again. I no longer speak to my father. My boyfriend and I had moved out of my dad's house that day. Thankfully, he had family who let us stay with them until we got on our feet. My dad and Sarah got together almost immediately after Adam's passing and they're still together. Their relationship is uber toxic and has caused many problems between us. Be careful who you allow into your life and the lives of your children. I'm a female volunteer for the fire department. And this happened a few years back when I was 20. During our drills at my former department, our bay doors are open so people have been known to walk in and talk to us and ask questions or just look at the trucks. One evening this 23 year old dude strolls by, a fellow firefighter from another town which is not common. Firemen stop by other departments all the time when in town. He made his rounds and was talking to my chief, my captain and the young guys. And he made his way over to me and started chatting me up. He was a nice guy, good looking and we exchanged snapchats. It didn't take us long to figure out that he was a psycho. A week after talking with me, he messages me. So how come you didn't swipe right? Confused, I asked him what he meant and then this unfolded. He told me all of this in an attempt to impress me with how devoted he was. He found me on a dating app, used my profile picture from the dating app to find my Facebook, since in one of my Facebook pictures I'm wearing a uniform that had my last name. Definitely my bad. He then used my profile picture to find out what fire department I was on by looking closely at the fire truck in the background. He told me he walked by my fire department 
almost every day to see when we drilled and to spot me, and that he's telling me this. I'm confused as heck and he then goes, I'm having a pretty rough day, can I come over? Cue to him telling me he's on his way. He used my Snapchat location to find my work and house. My location now is off on everything. When he arrived, he brought a love letter and gifts. He said he was sorry and confused and just really wanted things to work out. I told him that he needed to leave and never speak to me again, to which he obliged by leaving, saying if that would make me happy. He then made three to four new Snapchat and Facebook profiles in an attempt to add me back. At one point he got clever and made his Snapchat username Chris Smith 1990 which made me go, hey, it's my friend Chris Smith. Lo and behold, it isn't. Once I realized it wasn't my friend, but instead the psycho, he asked what I could do to make it up. I texted get lost and to set himself on fire. And then I got a video of him walking into the woods. And then he did that. He flicked a lighter over his hand and I thought, haha, yeah. Then his entire hand and arm lit up, followed by screaming and it cut out. I started to freak out thinking, oh crap, and immediately got a photo of the hairs on his knuckles and arms burnt off and his burnt shirt. He was okay and was coated in something flammable, but something that wouldn't actually damage him. Creep, I blocked him again. He stopped coming over after he presented himself at my house and he saw that I had a firearm. I didn't know how to use it, and I wasn't planning on using it in fairness, but it sent the point across. Back in 2012, when I got out of high school, me and my significant other at the time rented a trailer here in our town. We moved in and got settled, but I knew something was weird about the place from the beginning. The trailer was always so hot, even with the air conditioning on it would still be 90 degrees. The back bedroom was painted this horrible blue color, but you could still see some sort of stain on the walls under the paint. Think about the square diamonds mirror that are in the trailers. The stains were outlined under the paint. I was working at a Dairy Queen at the time and was talking about where we had moved to and just talking about how strange the place was. We live in an extremely rural town population of maybe 2000 so everybody knows everybody. A lady I worked with told me that that trailer was the one that Annie was murdered in. Everyone in town remembers the murder. It was over some drugs. She had been homecoming queen turned addict and it was a big deal. My cousin came and spent the night and I told him that we had heard about the trailer. He started provoking the spirit and saying, come get me then. At that moment, the electricity starts blinking and a moving box falls off the table. After that night, everything escalated quickly. The next week, we were laying in bed watching the devil inside and it sounded like someone had a shotgun right next to our head. It scared us both to death. So my significant other at the time got up to check the rest of the house and nothing had been touched or went off. We went to his parents for the evening for dinner and honestly just to get out the house. We came home around midnight and went to bed. He fell asleep, but I lay there. I felt like something was watching me. Our bed was facing the hallway and I could feel something watching me from there. I wasn't having sleep paralysis. I had just laid down. Whatever it was crawled on top of me and I could feel its breath on my neck and it smelled bad. I was trying to wake my significant other. I was crying and couldn't move. I was holding my arms down and finally I got my partner awake and he turned on the light. I never went to sleep that night. Another night we had some friends over for pizza and Halo. I was making the pizza and I had a stack of plates on the counter getting ready to serve. Then the whole stack of plates completely levitated off the counter. Everyone was completely in shock, but I was used to it by then. We finally ended up moving out about a week after. This experience didn't happen to me, but my friend. They were working during the day when the command had training. We all go to basketball stadium and listen to people talk. 
After the training, we go home and it's about 11. Great waste of time. My friend and I had watch and didn't get to go back. They were sitting there and the commanding officer walks in. The pleasantries are exchanged and the commanding officer goes to their office. After a few hours, the commanding officer calls and asks, I thought you said no one was here. Yes, sir. You're the only one here. You, myself and the rover. He then asked the rover to go walk around because he was very clearly hearing talking and walking down the hall. Remember, there's only one way in and one way out of this building, so you know when people come and go. Rover left, walked around the outside, and all fences were locked. We went first floor again, and the common area was empty. The offices were locked, and the second floor and common areas were clear. The commanding office was open with all the others locked. Rover came back and reported what they found, and the friend asked them if they went into the basement, which was a former morgue, and the kid said no, so away they went. During his look, he found and discovered that he could hear the commanding officer talking through a vent on the second floor. So as he's checking the area, he comes to the place where the lockers and old workout equipment is. He flips the light on in there, flips off the light, and then he hears a rattle. So he turns the lights on again, and now a locker is open. He couldn't remember for sure if it was open before or not. So he turns off the light and hears what sounds like music, and maybe a radio, coming from the locker, and the slamming of a metal door. At that point the kid ran, and they called the commanding officer and told him no one was around. There was also another occasion, where I was standing watch, and the ground had a big crash and shake like a server rack fell over. Someone went to look and there was nothing on the floor. No one has any explanation for that. There are also reports of a headless nurse, but I haven't seen her. A nurse would make sense since that's where all the deaths from the Pearl Harbor attack happened. Me and a long-term girlfriend parted ways, pretty much mutually as the relationship had fizzled out and was even becoming toxic in its own way. So I was more than happy to be done with it. In fact, I had been wanting to break it off for months, but I thought it would devastate her and had too much sympathy for her situation. We both moved on, and a few months down the line, I started getting random numbers or private number calls in the middle of the night, where it was just silence or nonsense. Then I got a warning message from the ex, saying that her current boyfriend was protective, jealous and fiery, and was convinced she still had feelings for me and vice versa, and or I was continuously trying to mess with her. That's the thing. I literally hadn't spoken to her since the breakup. One day, I decided to call the person that kept blowing me up in the middle of the night, and that was a mistake, as it fueled the dude to go into a rage. It started with long, rambling texts, Facebook messages and voicemails. I'm pretty sure the dude was harmless, but some of the material I have saved was to the level of felony harassment, i.e. death threats. Eventually, it died off and I forgot about it. Then one day, X hits me up saying she just wanted to be civil and catch up. I decide to decline as I want to avoid drama, but she insists her boyfriend trusts her now and there'll be no problems. We chat about some mundane stuff for a bit, and that was that. The next day I get a text from her number that is clearly him saying, We knew it all along. And, yeah, back to square one. Eventually I changed my number, continually blocked social media accounts until they finally broke up and it was all done. But holy hell, I'd never seen such an irrational human being and feel sorry for whatever poor girl that guy ends up with. I've always had a very peaceful life, raised by respectable parents who lived in a decent town and pretty much sheltered by the evils of this world. When I was in my early 20s, I had a few friends. They weren't bad kids by any means, but didn't use their heads and chose the best people to choose to be around. One night, my friends Zach and James were out cruising around. Now, Zach and James did have an issue with drugs. I was never so easily persuaded by peer pressure 
nor pursued a life to impress anyone. However, I had no problem standing my ground with anyone. Sometimes it's best if you walk away from any situation that you feel could go wrong, which is something I should have done that night. Luckily, I'm still here to share this story. I was out cruising with Zach and James and they make poor choices in life. They decide they wanna score some dope from a friend called Carly. She was an okay person, just another soul who became an addict. I was okay with going, although it was never my kind of scene. However, when I arrived, there are some people that I'd never met before. Have you ever met people and you instantly just get bad vibes from them? Well, this is one of those moments where you assess a situation and know you should just say, hey, I'm gonna go see another friend and walk away. I had that feeling that these guys aren't good people and I should have listened to my gut instinct, but didn't. We walked into Carly's house and I just got the sense that these people aren't the kind I want to associate with. Instead, I sit there and wait for Zach and James to do their thing and get the hell out. Well, it's not going as fast as I would like. That's when a guy called Ricky starts asking me a bunch of questions like where I'm from and who do I know. I'm sitting there playing it cool, listing off some people I know. There was one person who was known well, an old baseball team member and schoolmate who was a very troubled soul who got into plenty of trouble. Do you know Bishop? I said. That's when the Q&A session stopped and became a heated ordeal. I guess Bishop and Ricky had some beef with one another and things escalated quickly. Ricky began making threats towards me, saying he was gonna call up one of his friends which knew the friend as well. The other one was well known for violence and he was from the same small town as I was. Me being an idiot, I stood up and continued the senseless argument with him threatening me and that no one would ever find me when he was done with me. I foolishly spout back the same ignorance to him, despite it not being my nature. At the time, I just thought if I stood my ground, I would get respect. Carly's mom came in the room and told everyone they need to calm down and asked me to leave, to which I happily obliged. Fast forward 10 years in the future. I moved from my home state to Illinois and came back to visit family and friends. I was talking to my friend Jared, who was one of the closest friends I had for about half my life. He brought up the fact that Carly had passed away from an overdose. And he said, did you hear about her boyfriend, Ricky? I said no and asked what happened. Apparently, he had taken a girl from a local university, a ballerina. And the specifics of what he did to her are too horrific to mention but let's just say her remains were found in the woods. He was caught, convicted, and is now serving life in prison. Sadly, Carly and Ricky had a child together. Carly, of course, passed away, and the child's father is serving life in prison. My friend Zach also passed of an overdose as well a few years back. The world of drugs is a very dark place filled with people who are just as dark as the world they live in. Take my advice. If you find yourself in a situation you feel is uncomfortable and possibly dangerous, just turn around and leave. I got lucky as things could have been much more deadlier. I'm a South Asian female. This happened when I was in my first year of engineering and was almost 10 years ago. Harmless ragging was a thing back then. And as juniors, we were asked for no more than to sing a song or imitate a professor. You know, silly stuff. This one guy, a senior named Adish, happened to come across me in one of these silly ragging sessions and apparently found me interesting and cute. I wore shorts a lot and he even nicknamed me Sassy Pants and yelled it out whenever he sees me on campus, irrespective of the crowd of people. He tries getting my number through my classmates and hostel mates and tries to get me to add him on Facebook. When I don't respond, he threatens my friends to force me into talking to him. I do because I don't want them to get beaten up. I obviously didn't want to cause any problems as I was barely 18 and was away from home for the first time. Adish keeps asking me to go out with him 
and I keep refusing. One day I'm at the local ATM to take out some money, and it's a small room with just the machine. I didn't know he was there because I was facing the inner area, and he walks in and stands against the only door of the enclosure. I turn around in the vestibule, panicking, thinking I'm about to be robbed by this guy, when he says, come on, I'll drop you on campus on my bike. I refuse and he won't let me out. Fortunately, the guard comes and he obviously has to move. I share this with my friends and they're horrified as well. Now the stalking begins. He messages me on Facebook and says what color dress I wore and if something noteworthy happens in the lectures that I attended each day. He challenges me to find out how he is able to know so much. He knows my routines so well, he comes down to my hospital and openly asks me to go out with him in front of all of the maintenance staff. I again avoid responding and get mortified. I threaten him that if he interferes in my life, I'll report the behavior to the dean and other authorities. The creep responds, it's not like I asked you to sleep with me. I have tons of girls who wanna be with me and I ignore them all for you. I know girls play hard to get, but this is arrogant of you. Well, this goes on for six months near the end of the semester. Thankfully, he's in his final year and will graduate and has to get the hell out of there. And that was the only thought keeping me from having a nervous breakdown. On the day of the Foundation Day celebration on campus, it's evening and he calls me on my phone and asks me to meet him one last time. As usual, I ignore this. He calls up a friend of mine and threatens to throw acid on her, which she tearfully calls me and informs me leaving me visibly shaken. I tell my friends about this, and we're all still good friends even 10 years later, and they, my loyal soldiers, say okay. If he wants to talk to you one last time, let him, but in front of us. I tell him that, and he comes over to campus where the event is going on. My entire group of friends step out, seven of us, including me, which has four guys, and met him nearby. He asks in mock politeness if he can talk to me alone, and even before I respond with no, my gang are like, either you talk to her in front of us or not at all. He conceded and spoke some rubbish romantic talk, which doesn't matter, and finally leaves. He graduated a few days later, and I'm glad that I never saw or heard from him again. But what kind of messed up creature threatens to throw acid on someone? He was a real piece of work, and I hope to never meet you again. When I was around two, I had an attachment that I described to my mum as a Native American chief. Obviously, I have no recollection of this. This has been told to me. She told me I used to run from him screaming and crying, and after I was well past her, she could feel a burst of cold air follow. He tormented me day and night until she did some type of cleansing to banish him and placed a white candle in my window to keep him away. For as long as I can remember, she made sure I knew I couldn't move the candle, and it always followed us when we moved. We had a family friend who I referred to as Uncle John, though he had no relation to me. Apparently, I adored the man, and he would get me to dance a lot. After he passed, I would still talk to him and do the dance randomly. Around this time, a family member went to the hospital, and while in the room, I was looking out of the window and said, Mommy, look at all the angels out there. She said this is probably one of the scariest things I've ever said to her, but she can't really pinpoint why it was so frightening. Most of my childhood was fairly quiet after that, which I gave the candle credit for until my parents divorced and started dating again when I was in middle school. My dad met Margaret, who's a paranormal investigator and specifically could sketch spirits and I immediately adored her because I've always been interested in scary stuff, but my dad was a huge skeptic. There's a very small, very old cemetery a ways behind my dad's house, so she decided we were gonna do a mini investigation there one night. I was in charge of taking pictures while she tried to get EVPs. We couldn't hear or see anything while there, but I told her I could feel something. Without telling me what she was feeling, she asked me questions such as, do you feel they're male or female? 
Do they seem younger or older? I told her I thought there was a younger boy and his dad, to which she agreed. Soon after this, one of my legs started feeling cold and electrified. What most people describe when feeling touched by a spirit. We went back to check the pictures and recordings and found I had caught a lot of what appeared to be orbs. Most were white, but in some of the pictures we kept seeing, one was red. Upon listening, we heard a child, a man, a woman, and someone who sounded incredibly angry, maybe because we weren't aware of her. Even my dad was a bit taken aback and felt shaken because he couldn't explain it. Soon after, they broke up, and that was the end of my amateur ghost hunting days. A while later, when I was 16 or 17, my mom remarried and we rented a house that was surrounded by forest at least half a mile from the road. The bedrooms were on the opposite ends of the house and each had a private bathroom, and mine also had its own porch. Initially, I loved it. My own bathroom and porch? Hell yeah. But soon I realized that I never felt alone. It was worse on the porch or in the bathroom, but my closet doors were mirrors and I always felt very afraid of them. The first thing I noticed was that I hated my bathroom window, even when the candle in it. I always felt like someone was looking at me despite it being forest behind the house. I never looked at it and spent as little time as possible in the bathroom as I could. I felt the same way outside because the behind the porch, the area was forest. But I could never shake that feeling that some of the sounds never felt right. Obviously, some of it had to be living creatures in the woods, but some of the things I heard made my gut freak out. I knew it wasn't just an animal somehow. One thing I forgot to mention is that my bedroom had a smaller room attached to it, that I eventually made my bedroom while the original became my personal living room. I just couldn't stand sleeping in front of all those mirrors because the closet took up a whole wall. That room really didn't feel any better though, and I once took a picture that had a screaming face in it. The most chilling incident had to be the ghost creature though. My room attached to the kitchen on one side and the living room attached to the other. I was in the kitchen making food and out of the corner of my eye, I see what I thought was my mum's blue healer go into my room and under my bed, which was weird because he was far too fat to fit under the bed. I turn and walk into the living room only to see both dogs fast asleep on the couch. I stayed far away from the room for a few hours after that. Now I no longer have a candle. I moved so many times in a few years that I lost it and things are mostly normal. There was also one further experience that happened to my mother. Many years ago, my mom worked as an overnight CNA at a nursing home. I've seen this almost exact type of experience spoken of from other nursing homes after she told me. And I think the consistency is amazing. There were three spirits who roamed the halls and they named them the lady in white, the man in black and the priest. The first two descriptions were obvious and the priest was a greyish apparition. They knew when the residents were close to passing, when they mentioned one of the three visiting them in their room or when they saw the apparition enter a room. Additionally, they always died in threes. They all agreed the lady in white was to escort to heaven, the man in black was for hell, and they weren't sure about the third. Now the scariest thing my mum has ever told me is that I truly hope I never experience. She awoke in the middle of the night to a spectre standing above her. She saw his face and knew she was looking at death himself. To this day, she doesn't know why he was there or what he was doing. All that she knows is that she nearly crapped herself. She was quite unsettled and yet calm. I wonder if she was supposed to pass that night, but he had mercy on her. I'm glad he didn't take her and hope he waits a long time before he returns. In 2005, I hit Okinawa, Japan's shores at the ripe age of 19. I never had an experience or reason to believe in the paranormal at this point. 
For the next two years, all was well, drinking, smoking, and having fun. In 2006, I sustained an eye injury in Fallujah, Iraq, that put me out of commission. Every Marine is a rifleman, and as I could no longer shoot, they made me a barracks manager, as my unit was deployed yet again. I was pumped for this job, as I didn't want to be discharged before my four years were up. That, and everyone knew it was a skate job, aka easy as hell. I had the usual problems of broken furniture and such for a while. One day a marine comes into my office and tells me, there's a woman in a white dress with long black hair that covers half her face who sits in the upper corner of my room and watches me as I sleep. I think to myself this man has seen the ring too many times. I tell him I cannot move his room and to move on with it. At this point in time, I'm manager of Barrack 5696. There came a time when Barrack 5704, diagonal from us, was empty and we needed renovations. I was in charge of moving everyone to 5704 in order for renovations to begin. After all had been moved and everything was calm, I began an addiction to watching shows like Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters, back when they were really fresh and new and thought to myself, this is all rubbish, and found myself verbally saying such things out loud. And a buddy of mine said, hey man, don't you have the keys to 5696? He was right, I did. It was totally empty at night. Peaking my interest, I bought a tape recorder, old school, not a digital recorder, and went into the room the Marine told me about nearly a year ago, set it on top of the mirror above the sink and locked the door. I left and locked the main and only entrance to Barrack 5696 and went back to Barrack 5704. The next day I let the Japanese painters do their job, as I did every day, and went back up to room 423 to collect the recorder off the top of the mirror. I returned back to my office in 5704 and listened to the tape. I spent nearly four hours listening to nothing, dead space. Then it happened. The wall locker in a room next to or adjacent to room 423 began slamming shut, open and shut, open and shut. This went on for a few minutes before other rooms started as well. After a few minutes from the first slamming wall locker, it seemed like the building had come alive. I was disturbed as I was the only individual with a key there. Any enlisted, even above me, would have to either ask me for the key or get one made. Once they did, I cannot fathom them wanting to slam wall lockers closed in the middle of the night nor able to slam as many as I was hearing at the same time without 20 people at least to help. Yet I heard nothing but slamming wall lockers, no footsteps, no voices, no nothing. Knowing I placed the recorder and told no one, locked the door to the room and the main door to the barracks creeped me out. No one had access to the barracks nor knew of my intentions. I was convinced the ghost realm was real, just like Zack. I wanted to find what was out there. I wanted more proof of these spirits. Barracks 5696 was still under renovation, which meant it was completely empty at night, as there were no Japanese working crews then. And I held the only key. I convinced a buddy of mine who I will refer to as G to come with me. We were going to conduct a live ghost hunting session. As exciting as it sounds, it wasn't. We never heard or saw anything. Being our first time, we felt weird talking to empty rooms of nothingness. We felt like nothing was there, but we were wrong. We would pick random rooms throughout the barracks, opening whichever room we felt at the time. As we walked down to the office of 5696, as it still had power and the office was functional. We joked that there was nothing there and the banging wall locker still haunted my thoughts and I wanted to know more. So I plugged in my digital recorder into the PC 
and started the exhausting journey of reviewing our files, one for each room. G was unconvinced as we entered rooms three or four on the recording. Then it happened. I said the usual, good evening, my name's Will, and G asked, can you tell us your names? Clear as day, we get a response that said, get out. Neither of our voices, and we were within arm's reach of each other. This was the first of many threats I received, attempting to find the truth inside this barracks. A truth that came to manifest my home life, and made me never want to mess with the paranormal again. But I did. The allure was just too strong. And sometime later, the following events happened. I was living off base at the time with a girlfriend in a 10 story building. We were on the 10th floor and everything seemed fine when we moved in. At least she never mentioned anything at this point. After a few weeks of doing EVPs nightly at 5696, she started to talk about this shadow person. I asked her where she saw it. There wasn't anything about it other than shadow. Was it threatening towards you? All the usual stuff. She said it was always in the walk-in closet, had some color of glowing eyes, orange I think, and just creeped her out in general, but never tried to harm her. After hearing this, I started to freak out, as I was having some issues in 5696 that I never mentioned to her. It seems like I may have brought home, or perhaps it's been here the whole time. During this time frame, I started getting strange things on my EVPs. Not the usual get outs or hellos, but things that seemed far more intelligent and sinister. For example, I would always introduce myself. Hello and good evening, my name is William. I only wish to communicate and mean you no harm. Besides my name, these entities should have known nothing else about me. Yet I was getting responses from them calling me by my childhood nickname, a nickname I hadn't used in years, and the other guys with me damn sure didn't. They once asked who my mother was. Now this may not have been specifically aimed towards me, if it wasn't followed up by a whisper saying my mother's name which was a different voice from the first. I lost patches of hair on the back of my head that looked like fingerprints in a pattern, suggesting something had grabbed the back of it. Doctor said it was stress and gave me a steroid shot, but the hair refused to grow back for three months. Three months just so happened to be the same time I grew concerned with the EVPs I was getting and threw in the town. I locked 5696 up one final time and never returned there after dark. The hair that grew back was pitch black, and I had blonde hair, and stayed that way for many years. These days it's slightly lighter, maybe from sun exposure, but it's never been the same color it should be. Finally, I had a dream in a 10 story building right before I quit, and it was some kind of evil red creature laughing and prodding at me while it tortured me. When I woke and realized it was just a dream, I was relieved. Shortly after this dream of mine, which I never told anyone, my girlfriend had a similar dream. We went through a rough patch and I moved out of the apartment, but she left shortly after, stating something was bothering our son in the middle of the night, something unseen. Today, she's a minister and swears to me I brought something evil home all those years ago and that it has been following her. My friend Ed was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in April of a certain year. By July of that same year, he had been in hospital for about a month. His wife told me the night before he told her the strangest thing. He'd seen his father, uncles, and other relatives that had already passed on standing around his bed smiling at him. I told my wife to pack a few bags because within the next two days we would be getting the message that Ed had passed on. Surely enough, almost two days later, Ed's wife contacted us to tell us he had. How did I know? Ed was about the fifth person I knew personally that had contracted cancer then passed from it, and each of them had mentioned a day or two before they finally passed away that they'd seen dead relatives standing around their beds or standing in their rooms, smiling at them. 
having so much history myself with the paranormal. I don't freak out over creaks in the floor or the occasional door shutting on its own. I believe most things can be explained. When we first moved into this house in Washington three years ago, we saw a few random orbs here and there, nothing that felt harmful. In fact, one orb even danced to the music alongside my granddaughter one day, and it felt like a child. The house sits on acres of field, surrounded by forest and a few farms. For some reason, the guest room, laundry room and bathroom are always freezing cold. Plus, cool air comes from the guest bedroom closet. I keep a blanket hanging up in the hallway door to keep the cold isolated. I figure those rooms are just cold because they are added on and are built halfway over our well. I have my mother's ashes in my home, but at the same time I felt bad because when I was asked if I wanted my sister's ashes later, it scared me for some reason. I don't know why. She was a very loving person, but for many years I felt darkness around her and I just couldn't. A year passed and that fear left me. I remember her telling me one day before she died that she had a recurring dream of her death and she was stuck in the desert. It then dawned on me that her ashes were being cared for by my daughter who lives in the desert. It was time to let her be here with mum. After she arrived, her ashes were placed next to our mother's ashes outside my room. And like my mother, she was surrounded by some of her mementos. At first, there wasn't a problem. But after time, that's when the kids started seeing and experiencing things that made them feel uncomfortable. It didn't feel like my sister. This was something else. Strangely, absolutely no one in the family has felt her presence since she passed. I know my kids look towards me for assurance. I guess they thought that, like in other homes, I could just make it all go away. But I think this stayed hidden from me in the beginning and preyed on those who showed fear. So it was targeting my grown kids, that being my son and his fiance. I felt bad. I kept telling my son that there was nothing here and that our house wasn't haunted because we cleansed it after my sister passed away. Cody, if you're hearing this, I'm sorry for not wanting to believe you at the time. I was just trying to protect you and the kids from being scared. So there are a few things that have been happening in our home for the past few years. One late afternoon, I was at the store. So my son and his fiance were watching my two grandchildren for me. They were playing hide and seek. They told me something wasn't right in there. Each of them experienced what they said felt like someone or something taking up space within them in the closet, practically in their face. It had been a toy room in the beginning, but the kids wouldn't play in there. The only person who has ever slept there with no problem is my ex on a visit. He was a non-believer until just the day when we were sitting in there watching a show together and we observed his dog intently follow something move around the room. Then the bathroom door opened and his dog watched whatever it was going to the bathroom and the door shut behind it. At that point, his dog dove under the blanket. My ex's eyes were as big as saucers and he asked me if I saw what he saw. Laughing inside at the former non-believer, I said yes. No one will ever sleep in there, not even me. Six months ago, my son told me that he went into the kitchen to grab something to drink the night before, and he saw a dark shadow over his left shoulder in his reflection on the microwave. He turned around quickly to look behind him, and there was nothing there. He still felt something close to him and the hair on his arm and neck were raised. So when he looked into his reflection this time in the window over the sink, and again, it was back with its head even closer to his. Then the cabinet door shook back and forth, then opened all the way and shut. He said that he yelled, not caring if he woke anyone up 
and ran upstairs to his room. I don't blame him. Many times he and his fiancée have seen big shadow masses in corners of various rooms, but never in my bedroom. Waiting outside my door, where my sister's ashes are, but never inside my room. There was a time not too long ago they were both sitting in my van talking one night. And they said the form of a man came out from behind a tree, crossed the grass, and sat with his hands in his lap on the front porch and then faded away. Then they told me about the bathroom. Oh my, that bathroom. I can't even. His fiancée was taking a bath after everyone had gone to sleep, as to not disturb anyone. She was relaxing in our big old claw bathtub in the quiet of night, and she heard all of us sleeping, so she knew for a fact no one was up. There was a tapping on the bathroom door, and she answered. To no response. The doorknob started to jiggle, then stopped. So she asked again, Who is it? I'm in the tub. There was still no response. She thought that whoever it was decided to go to the other bathroom, so she relaxed. And she was laying there. But then something felt off, as she heard a noise at the door. And she watched as the doorknob slowly unlocked itself. When she told me that, my blood ran cold. This didn't just happen once. My son was sitting in there and he heard tapping, followed by the door unlocking on him too. The other day, my son said that he had gone to the bathroom around three in the morning. He knew everyone was asleep because he heard all of us snoring. So he didn't quite shut the door all the way, but it was closed. He heard heavy breathing as if someone had their mouth at the crack of the door. Then he heard a quiet voice whisper, I can hear you. That poor boy was scared to death. I, for the first time, experienced the doorknob unlocking itself on me three times in a row in my bathroom last night. That surprised me. It has not always been bad experiences here, though. Since my mother passed, I feel her sometimes around me. We all do. Just last month, I was talking to my son in the living room, and I saw a light. We don't live near a street, so it wasn't from a car. It was soft and illuminating, as it floated from the front window curtain around to the wall behind my son. I got such a warm feeling and said, Hey, Mama, and watched it as it went behind the recliner, where my son was sitting, and then up behind his head and disappeared. He didn't see this or know why I said that. Just then he shrugged his shoulders up and put his hands on the back of his head, saying that it felt like his hair was being stroked. That brought tears to both of us. We all know when she is here because it feels warm and loving like her. And sometimes we smell her sweet perfume. My grandson who is autistic was too young to comprehend my mother's passing. He sometimes talks to her, almost like he is answering what seems to be a question. He is only six and has the purest soul. I wish I could hear her voice speak to me again. And then you have things that happen that at the time you didn't understand. But when you find out everything falls into place, this was one such time. In March, I had a few aluminium balloons left over from my grandson's birthday, and they lasted a very long time. All of them fell to the floor except one particular balloon. It kept following me midway in the air around the house. The air conditioner nor heater was on, and all the windows were shut. I went to my bedroom, and it followed and stayed in my bed. I went into the laundry room, and it followed there as well. This went on for a solid week after a while. It just started getting annoying, but we didn't think anything of it. We just swatted it away. One day, my son and I were talking in the kitchen, and it came in from the living room, where we just saw it laying on the floor moments before and lowered itself to go under the door frame and stopped mid-height between us. He took it 
and pushed it back into the living room. Not four minutes later, and it was back mid-height between us. This time, he put it all the way in the laundry room, and it still made its way back, lowering to come through two door frames and staying afloat midway between us again. At that point, it was too weird. We both looked at each other and said, nah. So I took it and said, okay, okay. If this is you, mum, do it again. I put it back in the living room and it stayed there floating. It didn't feel like her at the moment. It felt different, almost familiar, but not in a bad way. We went back to talking and there it was again between us. Well, I didn't know this at the time. In fact, I only just found out a few weeks ago that my dear friend passed away in March and his family didn't have my number to tell me. One of the last things he told me was that when he dies, he was going to come harass me just for fun and let me know that he's here and he loves me. When I found out, I called out to my son saying, it was Tom, it was Tom after all. After I told him the sad news, he said that it gave him a bit of peace. We all knew that this is something he would do and it blew our minds. I just wish I found out then so that I could have told him that I love him too. Three nights ago, I saw a light low to the ground in the kitchen. And five minutes later, my granddaughter saw the same light formed like a feather fluttering in front of her. My son also told me that a light trailed up over and across in his room. Another time he walked into my room and saw a light above my head. My neighbor is confident something happened on this land. I talked to him to see if he had been experiencing or seeing anything unusual without making myself look crazy. He said that he does not go out after dark, but he has heard the screams in the forest and his pets acting strangely from time to time. As we were talking, his roommate came home and asked me what we were talking about. When I told him, he pointed to the young man I was talking to first and said, you see, I'm not nuts. Apparently, he had seen things as well and calls what he sees in his bedroom a demon boy because he doesn't know what it is. He even saged in this room. And if you think about it, that goes along with the orb that danced with my granddaughter when we first moved in. And no, it's not a demon. I think that perhaps it's a child that connected or roams the property. We have seen so many beautiful things here that it outweighs the bad. Someday after I'm gone, I hope to be a part of it. I want to be the whisper of encouragement if my loved one's ears and a gentle stroke upon their face. I want them to always know that they don't have to be afraid and that they are and always will be loved from now until forever. As for what is in this house, I think since I have been more aware of the darkness, it shows itself less. I do enjoy feeling my loved ones around though, and my kids do too. Someday we will move from this place and hopefully one of our loved ones will follow. Today, when I arrived home after running errands, my ex told me that without a doubt, he saw something. At first, I told him to stop playing around because I thought he was making fun of us. I've known this man for 24 years, so I know when he's serious. And this time he was definitely shaken. He said that he was standing in the guest room and he was about to go into the bathroom to wash his hands when someone tall who he thought was my son turned on the light and darted into the bathroom really fast, closing the door behind him. He waited for a bit, but didn't hear anything. He got tired of waiting, washed his hands in the kitchen and still hadn't heard anything for a while. So we went to the door and asked if my son was okay to not receive an answer, but the light was still on. He tentatively pushed open the door to find nothing. Confused, he went to my son's room and knocked and asked him why he did that and left the light on. But when my son came out of his room, he was wearing a burgundy shirt and pants. With a shake in his voice, my ex asked, if he had changed his clothes, to which my son responds, no, why? 
The person my ex saw was wearing a blue t-shirt and shorts. My son told me that when he opened the door, my ex turned pale. On another occasion, my son's fiance was in the kitchen today and we are all putting away groceries. She has mid-length hair and in front of everyone, her hair flipped up like someone tossed it. It freaked her out and she said it gave her shivers. I promised my other son I would come help paint his new place. So I bathed my grandkids and made them something to eat. I figured I would only be gone a few hours, but it took way longer than expected. When I arrived, there were all kinds of commotions going on in my room, and my grandson was crying uncontrollably. No one could understand him because he was so upset, so he was trying to act out what just happened. After I calmed him down, he told me that he was getting tired and laid down. He said something woke him up, and he heard my car, so he went towards the bedroom door. When a dark hole formed at the top, outside my door, and a dark shadow boy thing came out of it. He said the boy stood in the doorway and pushed him back and slammed the baby gate, trapping him in the room. He said it was evil. He kept saying that over and over, he's evil. After the gate shut, my grandson screamed. So everyone in the house ran to see what was wrong. I know kids have active imaginations, but I know him. He's autistic and he doesn't lie or make things up. He was visibly shaken up. And since last night, his story hasn't changed. I work night shift at Walmart. My shifts are always from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Except in the first few months of the year when they're cutting back on hours and I sometimes start at 11 p.m. and leave at 6 a.m. Late last year, around September, when the weather was still nice outside. I went into Walmart during the day to buy some groceries. I had a few things in my basket and was walking out from the back of the store towards the self checkout area. I noticed out of my peripherals that a man probably in his mid twenties, a little taller than me and wearing a baseball cap was approaching me from the other side of the features. Those promo displays that sit in the middle of the big aisles. When he was done, he started talking to me like we were acquaintances. I see people I know here all the time when I'm here. Oh, I asked, assuming he'd seen me in the morning while I was working. Yeah, it's weird how every time I come here, I see the same people all the time. He kept rephrasing himself and I didn't really know what to say. It was pretty awkward. He kept making small talk as I didn't stop walking to the self checkout and was kind of just going along with the conversation like you do when some random person is talking about the weather. Now that I look back on it, when he told me he sees the same people all the time, I thought he looked a little familiar and assumed he was a vendor and worked some mornings there. And I mistakenly mentioned I worked there and also see the same faces. Then he told me to have a nice day and I checked out and went to my car dismissing the interaction. A lot of fellow employees greet me at Walmart when I go there during the day, so I didn't think much of it. Then it got super weird, super fast. I was just leaving the parking lot and the exiting road splits into a left only lane and the other a straightaway. I was turning, stopped, when this white Ford Explorer pulls up next to me and beeps loudly. I was already turning, but looked in my rear view and sure enough, it was the guy from earlier. I recognized his face and baseball cap. He sat at this stop, watching me pull away. All right, a little weird, but he's probably just being friendly. When I got home, I told my boyfriend and he immediately thought it was strange and then said I was wrong for even engaging in conversation with this man because sometimes some guys can get the wrong idea. My boyfriend also works with me on my shift, but his car has a blown head. So we've just been using my car to commute back and forth from work. So one night I don't work, my car is still there if he works. Keep in mind that as employees, we aren't allowed to park close to the store. We are limiting the parking at the far end of the lot 
or in front of the other stores in the shopping centre. I have a typical spot. I always park in front of the AT&T place, which is next to the gym, which is next to Walmart. About two months ago, my boyfriend said he went to walk out the car on break and saw a white Ford Explorer parked next to it, with a guy sitting within it. When he saw my boyfriend, he left. This happened again in the same month, except my boyfriend was sitting in the car, and the white Ford Explorer drove up to Walmart, then passed my boyfriend staring at him. Then last month, I was driving home from work. It was barely 7am, still pretty dark outside, and I was cruising down the highway towards the exit for my town. There was a car following two lengths behind me. We were both doing the speed limit, nothing abnormal. And suddenly this car begins to speed up. Gets in the fast lane as if to pass me, but slows down so that we are neck and neck. The driver turns on his interior lights, waves at me and then speeds off. It was the guy in the white Ford Explorer. I just stared at him bewildered. I didn't know what to think. Then it dawned on me. He knows where I work. He knows what my car looks like. It's pretty distinguishable even from the back. I have sharp things along the top, decals, mud flaps, etc. He probably was waiting for me to leave work and then followed my car when I left. Thank God he didn't follow me home because I never would have realized it. I was totally unsuspecting when I walked out to my car alone. Now, what happened a few days ago is why I'm even sharing this. I think this is when it started to escalate. It was a typical night. Both my boyfriend and I worked along with our co-workers and friend called Mark. When Mark works, we always park next to him so we can talk on lunch and breaks with the windows rolled down. Mark parks further away from the store, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. We finish up for the night, clock out, and Mark heads out to his car while my boyfriend and I buy some stuff to make for dinner. We check out and head to the car. Mark is still there, which is unusual for him since he books it out of there like a bat out of hell every time his shift is up. Hey man, did you get my text? He calls out, smoking a cigarette. No, let me check my phone. My boyfriend pulls out his phone and I see a pretty long unread text from Mark. Pretty much, this weird guy came out of nowhere and was touching and looking at the inside of your girlfriend's car, Mark says. My immediate thought was, some randomer likes my car enough to come up and touch it. Weird, but okay. Like he just walked up and started touching the fins and looking inside. Then when he saw me sitting there, he asked me about the decorations. I told him I didn't know anything about them, and he told me to have a nice day. We immediately started checking for damages, slash tires, etc., but there was nothing. We get in the car, and the three of us just sit there, contemplating the reasoning behind this. The Ford Explorer guy had almost slipped my mind. His encounters were a month or so apart, but then I started thinking about him again. There were two cars parked near us. A white 2010 Pontinac G6, and surely enough, a white Ford Explorer. Up until this point, I didn't know the make of the car he drove, but I knew it was definitely a white SUV. Mark said he came from the direction of those two cars, so unless he walked to Walmart at 7am, one of those cars was his. The Explorer was facing the opposite direction and I quickly wrote down the number plate. I started asking Mark what the guy looked like. About your boyfriend's height, kind of a gangster looking guy. Keep in mind I've only seen this guy once when he wasn't in this car, which was four months prior. I had sounded right, but I didn't really know. We decided to sit there and wait until this guy came out and confront him. Just as we were about to give up and leave, the guy starts walking our way out of Walmart. He was wearing a black hoodie, dark jeans, and a camo bandana. When he saw us, he put on sunglasses. Both of us looked towards Mark. Is that the guy? No, no, that's not him. Mark shook his head. The guy walks into the Explorer, sits in the driver's seat and lights a cigarette with the door open. After he closed it, I looked back at Mark. Are you sure that's not him? Yeah, it's him. That's the guy, Mark nodded. 
Explorer guy starts his car and looped around our car, staring at us, then looped again to the exit of the parking lot. Mark said he didn't want to tell us it was the guy because he didn't want my boyfriend to lose his job. I'm pretty sure Mark would have told us if it was the guy, then some stuff would have gone down. I'm pretty positive now that this guy has been stalking me. For how long, I don't know. I'm starting to think the guy drove to Walmart. I want to assume to buy something since he walked out with nothing. Saw my car parked next to it, then realized while he was casing my car that Mark was sitting there. So he asks Mark about the shark fins to try and make him think he was just interested in how it looked and not being completely shady and creep the hell out. But I have his plate number. The morning before we left work, my boyfriend bought me pepper spray and I'm now parking elsewhere and I'm going to start asking co-workers if they'll take me to my car in the mornings when I'm alone. I don't know what I can do or if anyone would take this seriously because he hasn't tried anything yet. Sadly, I'm a pretty dainty girl, too brave for my own good, and I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag. But I don't think this is over yet. Last night I was stocking yogurt alone at around half midnight, when I hear, excuse me, from behind me. Thinking it was a typical customer question, I turn around while politely replying, yes? When I fully turned, it took me a moment to realize who was approaching me stalker. I know that my facial expression probably spoke volumes about my fear for a little while, but I didn't want to alarm or upset him, so I kept calm and spoke to him like I would any other customer. I'm not a stalker or anything, he prefaced, but I was just wondering where you got those decorations for your car. I see it a lot and I'm curious. I got them off eBay. Before I could finish, he interrupted me trying to keep the conversation going. Do you know what they're called? Pretty sure they're called diffusers because they're meant to diffuse airflow on the car. I got them off eBay for $20, the whole set. Oh, okay, thanks. Have a nice night. He smiled and walked away. What the hell? I'm not a stalker or anything. Yeah, dude, you are. I think I was in shock because there was no way I should have been that calm and nonchalant while talking to him. I know for a fact he was just trying to cover his ass since we pretty much caught him red handed that day. I really hope I never see him again, because he knows we're on to him. I grew up in Eastern Kentucky, and my parents were in the military. One went to Iraq to fight the war, then came back. The other got deployed within a year to Iraq slash Afghanistan. My parents were not the best because they were going through a lot of their own emotional struggles related to PTSD. Both were heavy alcoholics and they cheated on each other all the time. By this time I was 10, when my dad was gone after my mum came back and it reached its peak. She would go out to bars all night and leave me and my sociopathic brother home alone to fend for ourselves. One night she was actually home and for some reason I was terrified to go into my room. So I asked if I could sleep in my mum's room while she watched TV in the living room. She said it was okay and I went and climbed into bed and started hearing this noise like a clicking noise. I looked over to where I thought it was coming from, my mum's closet. I felt uncomfortable, so I went out the room and tried to play it off like I wasn't tired yet, but my mum made me go back in. As soon as I got in the bed and looked over at the closet, one of her shoes was floating a foot and a half off the ground. I jumped out of bed and scrambled out the room so fast, I told my mum what happened and she said she would come lay with me until I went to sleep. I'm pretty sure she thought I was just being a kid, you know, monsters under the bed kind of deal. Then she started hearing the clicking too. She got freaked out and made my brother sleep in the room with us for everyone's safety. The clicking continued and we felt very uncomfortable and unsafe. We finally fell asleep after we all prayed continuously. In the middle of the night, my mum had to use the restroom, so she turned on the light to her ensuite. The yellow bulb blew up, sending glass everywhere, and almost immediately after, a wind rushed down the hallway and knocked all the pictures off the wall, and then there was silence. There were no doors or windows open, the air wasn't on, and it was to this day the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. 
I think all of the built-up emotion from everyone in the house compounded and created this, perhaps. This poltergeist. The house was quieter after that, but our family struggles continued until it broke apart. For the better. And everyone could move on. I was a junior at college, coming back to my dorm room after a night of fun with friends. Now I had a drink or two over the course of the night, but I definitely wasn't drunk. I should also mention that my college was about 200 years old and connected to a Benedictine monastery, but will come into play later. So anyway, I walk into my room and turn around and lock the door. My roommate had moved out to live with her boyfriend, which hadn't bothered me until maybe a few weeks before that night. I liked having more space and turned her bed into a lounge area, obviously. But I had started hearing what I can only describe as breathing noises. The dormitory was old though, so I talked it up to the radiator and continued on with college life. That night I heard the breathing and ignore it, washed my face, ate some cookies and then curled up in my bed and went to sleep. This is where things got weird. I woke up at some point and my room was dark, of course, but I could see an even darker outline of a tall, skinny man with a wide brimmed hat just standing in my doorway looking at me. As soon as I looked at it, I felt really, really sick, but also really tired and fell back asleep and passed out. The next morning, I assumed it was a really freaky dream and said nothing to anyone. A few weeks pass, the breathing is louder, and I'm having super violent, super religious dreams on a nightly basis. I'm not mentioning any of this to my friends because I don't want them to think I'm a nutcase. Well, one day we're all BSing about our college one night, when one of our friends who was getting ready to enter the monastery told us that our campus was haunted. Right we said, like every other college campus. He said, no, one of his priest friends at the monastery said that there are a few things hanging around the campus, but there's only one that you need to worry about. A tall, skinny man wearing a wide brimmed hat. Well, I about lost it and asked my friend what I should do if I saw it. He told me to go to confession, put prayer cards around my window and doors, and pray some very specific prayers. So I did, immediately. That night, the breathing noises and violent dreams stopped. And thank God, I never saw that thing again. When I was younger, my grandma told me a story about when she was a teenager. She was walking down a road with the boy that she was dating. When all of a sudden, this dog came up to them and walked beside them keeping pace. The dog was basically transparent, and my grandma and the boy pretended they couldn't see it until it vanished. I am a 36 year old woman, and while growing up in our house, we always knew it was haunted. We had an old lady and an old man spirit who we called the shadow man at our home. When my stepdad would do things he shouldn't be doing, He'd wake up with these weird scratches on his back. They looked like someone had taken a pin and carved them in. When I was younger, all of us kids would watch these lights flicker on and off in our house. And our grandma's rocking chair would also start to swing entirely on its own. When I was 15 or 16, I would sleep during the day as I've always been a night person. And one time I awoke because the upper part of my right leg felt like it was on fire. When I looked at the spot that felt like it was on fire, I noticed that there was an upside down cross engraved on my leg. Fast forward. In 2004, I had my daughter. She was sleeping in her bouncy seat that I had sitting on the floor. And after she'd been sleeping for a while, I stopped the bouncy seat from bouncing. I was relaxing on the couch with my daughter sleeping and all of a sudden, her bouncy seat started going off by itself. I wasn't scared, more comforted and peaceful. I thought it was my grandma trying to comfort me. After I had my third child, me and my husband split up. He was quite abusive. We were staying in a domestic violence shelter that was also haunted. It said that there was a woman that lived there when it was a single family home 
and the mother had ended the life of her child. At the time, we were the only ones staying there. One night, my kids were sleeping, and I was walking down the hall to go downstairs when I heard a child call out, Mummy? I knew it wasn't my kids since they were asleep, and I pretended not to hear it as it was just easier for me to do so. The last night that we were there, we had been watching a movie and eating popcorn. After my kids fell asleep, I went downstairs to wash the popcorn bowl. When I went back upstairs to our room, there was a pillow over my son's face. My kids were all in separate beds and the pillow over his face had come from the bed which was on the other side of the room. I rushed over to him and removed the pillow and ended up calling my husband and we returned to live with him. In the summer of 2015, I was outside smoking a cigarette and it was dark. Any time I would be outside at night, I would look up to the stars and just relax. One night I was outside and across the street above the trees, there was this huge set of lights. The lights were in the shape of an arrow. There were several different colors to it. Each arrows were of different colors, but they were connected. It didn't really make much sense to me. I pretended I didn't see it until I finished smoking my cigarette. Then I went inside to get my husband and told him about it. And he went back outside with me, only to see it had been gone. Two years down the line, I left my husband for good and moved into my own place. One morning I woke up to what felt like someone trying to suffocate me with their hands over my nose and mouth, even though I was not able to see anyone standing over me. I was fighting to try and breathe and it took me a little bit to be able to breathe. I was yelling at whatever it was and after a little bit, whatever it was left. Only it left behind fingerprints on my face and throat. Later that day, my neighbors asked me what happened because the fingerprints on me turned to dark bruises. I work in the home healthcare field. My job title is DSP, Direct Support Provider, and I work with mentally disabled adults. And there is something about mentally disabled people that draws spirits to them in my opinion. There were nights, the pounding on the walls and ceilings would be so loud that clients would wake up. One night I was cleaning, and in between where I swept the staff bathroom to where I went to mop the floor, there appeared to what looked like blood droplets on the floor. Another night I was cleaning the commons area or living room, and all of a sudden I heard this low, deep growl sound. You know, like the type of growl a dog does before it attacks? Keep in mind, there is really thick plexiglass on the windows, so you won't be able to hear a dog growling outside. This growling came from what sounded like one of my client's bedrooms. I pretended that it was one of the clients as again, it is just easier for me to do that so that I don't walk off the job. When my boss came in that morning, I asked her if we got a dog that I didn't know about. She told me no, and I told her what I heard. When I came in later that night for shift, she told me that another DSP was outside smoking a cigarette, and they both heard the same thing. The other DSP ran inside the house so fast, her feet barely touched the deck. One night I was at work, and my kids were scared out of their minds. My two boys fell asleep in bed together because they were playing on the PlayStation. My older son woke up with a pillow over his face, he tried to get it off but wasn't able to get it off and he ended up repeatedly kicking my youngest son to get him to wake up. When my youngest son woke up, even he had trouble removing the pillow. Eventually, the two of them were able to do it and called me up crying, terrified. About a month ago, my boyfriend and I were at our house drinking. I was sitting with my back to the open window. I only had two shots of tequila at that point and I have a big phoenix tattoo on my left shoulder. All of a sudden, the lines of the phoenix were raised. It was almost as if someone recarved the lines of the phoenix. Keep in mind, I've had this tattoo for four years, so the lines of the phoenix shouldn't have been raised like they were. It burned so bad, I was nearly crying. About three weeks ago, I was at work. The window was closed, so there wasn't any breeze going through the house in the window. I was in a commons area cleaning when I heard a crash come from the office. 
the flashlight had been thrown to the middle of the floor. That same week I was cleaning the kitchen at work. I was listening to the song Down by the River to Pray from the movie Oh Brother Where Art Thou. My clients were sleeping and that song was playing and I heard the deep, dark, evil laugh. Again, I pretended it was one of my clients so that I wouldn't walk off the job. The thing is that no one else has been dealing with this other than I, and I think it might be following me. If anyone has any idea on what I can do to get this thing to stop following me around, it would be greatly appreciated. I can't use sage because I'm highly allergic. My family also has reason to believe that we're cursed, so any advice on that would also be greatly regarded. This happened to my friend Simone a while back. She got into a relationship with a guy who she adored. He constantly doted on her. He had money and came from a line of it, but that didn't make their relationship any more stable. After the honeymoon period of about three months, things start to go off the rails. She couldn't come hang out with the girls anymore. There was always an excuse. She was always busy. We would often go to the movies together, just us two, but even these would be canceled, and I was her best friend. She started telling me that she didn't want to speak to me that much anymore, but her boyfriend was consuming a lot of her time. Non-stop texts, asking where she was when she was at school. It became really infuriating. She even had to quit her job as a nanny of these two adorable children because the guy became concerned that she may just fall in love and sleep with the husband. Really messed up stuff. After a while, I actually went round her house and spoke to her mum about it. I felt like it was the best thing to do. She wasn't in a good place. And after a good chat and staying over for dinner, crying and falling asleep together on her bed, we agree that the best course of action would be to tear off the band-aid and let this guy go. It took her about a month, but she dumped him. She finally saw how manipulative he was being and how it's not normal to try and control your partner's life. But then the stalking began. He started sending her gifts, all of which she refused. Then, following her, she got a new job working at a supermarket. She'd be followed home in her car by her ex. When she got home, he'd usually just drive on and she began to get really annoyed. She had ceased contact with him about three months ago at this point and she started messaging her again, demanding why he was still following her, that they were broken up and that he should just get over it. He said that he still loved her and that he would not relent until they were together again. He didn't stop saying this, and said that he needed to make sure she got home safely. It was his number one concern because he loved her, that she was his soulmate. As you can imagine, this went down really well. So well, in fact, she ended up getting a restraining order, which didn't do much until they tried to get further police involvement, at which point he finally got the memo that perhaps it's best to let sleeping dogs lie. And that's how the story ended. But it was a very challenging year. Thankfully, Simone is now with the lovely guy. I am a 21-year-old female and moved to a new city last year for work. I had a lot of trouble finding a decently affordable place to live. So at the time, as I now have an affordable house to rent. I found a small apartment on the edge of a bad part of town, but it was affordable and newly renovated. Initially, when I moved in, I had no issues, but soon discovered that the couple upstairs were a little rough around the edges, always screaming at each other, throwing things, slamming doors, and it made for a lot of sleepless nights. One thing I found out was the guy upstairs was a dealer, and this is important when we get to the main part of the story. One night I had got home from work pretty late, so by the time I finally cleaned up dinner and started getting ready to sleep, it was around 10.30. I had just laid down in bed when I heard a knock on the door, and honestly, 
I shouldn't have even considered opening it because, well, three things. It was 10.30 at night, I wasn't expecting anyone, and to get into the building and up to the apartment doors, you have to have a key or have an apartment buzz you in. Still, I made my way to the front of the door and cracked it open and found a man, probably in his late 20s, wearing a black hoodie and jeans, rocking back and forth in my doorway. As soon as he saw the door open, he leaned right in, trying to push his way into my apartment, repeating the same sentence over and over. I need to talk, Brad, let me in. Obviously, I didn't want this guy in my apartment, so I'm just trying to shove the door closed while telling the man that no Brad lives here, it's just me. This went on for what felt like forever, but probably lasted no more than a few minutes. Suddenly, he stood up straight and just walked away and said nothing. I was a little shaken, so I went into my room and just sat there for a while, wondering why the hell I would open the door in the first place to a stranger. I ended up hearing a commotion from the lobby area and went down and saw how this guy got into the building. The glass front door was completely smashed, which explains how he got in. Going back to the neighbor upstairs, and this was someone who regularly bought from him, who was coming into the building trying to find him for some reason, that I can only imagine was pretty sinister by the way he was trying to get into my apartment. Hopefully, we'll never meet again. In the mid-1990s, I was a hospital corpsman in the Navy. My first duty station was Naval Hospital Beaufort in Beaufort, South Carolina. I was assigned to the branch medical clinic, BMC, at Marine Corps Recruitment Depot, Paris Island. I have many stories from my time there, some paranormal and some not. At the time I was assigned to Paris Island, all incoming corpsmen had to do a two-week night duty, where we would man the phones and radios from 10 o'clock to 6 a.m. During this time, we would also tidy up the trauma room and the emergency treatment room, and make sure all handheld radios were on their charging bases and fully charged and making sure the trauma bags taken out by corpsmen covering the recruit activities were fully stocked. The first few nights of my rotation were uneventful. About the fourth or fifth night, I came in to find the duty crew a bit spooked. I had been told on my first day of processing into my new duty station that the main hospital and Paris Island were haunted. Made sense to me. All the buildings were really old. Anyway, that one night I came in and the duty crew told me the radios had been weird the entire evening, but failed to go into any detail. I settled in for the night with some music playing softly in a book. After a bit, I heard one of the radios being keyed, like someone was pressing the talk button to create a noise. Certain that someone was messing with me, I went and checked the handhelds and all were accounted for, and off. Nobody else used our frequency. Throughout the night, I would hear the radios being keen, always in odd patterns. It took several nights of this before I recognized the patterns as Morse code, S-O-S, -S, but no one was there. A few times, the television in the lounge would turn on and off. It would also change channel frequently. You would hear odd noises in unoccupied parts of the clinic. Most of the time, these noises came from the area where recruits came in for their immunizations and medical processing. This area used to be the trauma bay until the 1980s. Back in the late 1960s and 70s, no one sure when, but it was Vietnam era, it said that there was a recruit who was on fire watch one night and started experiencing shortness of breath and chest pains. He didn't want to wake anyone, so he waited for his relief to take over. Then he walked from 2nd Battalion to the BMC, about a mile and a half. He was unable to open the door and pounded on it, but no one heard him. And he passed away from cardiac arrest, and wasn't found until next morning. That door is no longer used for emergencies, and is supposed to stay locked. No matter how many times we would lock the door, it would not remain locked. 
Sometimes we would hear the door opening and closing in the middle of the night, but no one was ever there when we investigated. My last night on night duty, I had just finished cleaning up the treatment room. I was setting up chairs in the corridor for patients to sit on, when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked up and saw a tall, skinny recruit standing at attention towards the end of the corridor near a recruit processing and the door that would not lock. I called him out, asked what he wanted. He didn't appear. I called out again and there was no answer. I began to walk towards him and he vanished. That was by far not the last time I was ever on duty at night at the clinic, but luckily it was the last time I ever saw an apparition at the clinic. We built our house on an empty lot, giant oak tree, but other than that, no evidence of anything ever being here. Rather than walking through to our front door, which you have to walk through the muddy grass yard to get through when it rains, we come in through the garage. When you enter the garage, there's a small room you go through no bigger than a closet, about four by four feet called the mud room, where we hang coats and put our boots, and then you enter a second door into the kitchen. Right beside the kitchen is a door that used to be to our guest bedroom. This was for my grandparents when they would come visit and was right by the door because my grandmother couldn't climb stairs. Today though, they have moved closer to us from five hours to five minutes down the road. We turned the room into a schoolroom at first. My younger sibling is homeschooled. There's an old fashioned school desk, a shelf, the mattress from the guest bed against the wall, a cookbook, shelf, a dresser that has been there since the guest room was still a sleeping room, and a lamp by the nightstand. Anyway, a while ago on Twitter, there was something you may have heard of. It was called Dear David. It was the story of a guy who started seeing this kid ghost in his house, and it's a long, long thread that's absolutely terrifying. To this day, I can't read it, unfortunately. When I go to find the link, it looks like it may have been deleted, but I'm sure you can still find it. Anyway. The day after I read the real story thread, I was walking past the schoolroom and I swear to you, I saw a little boy. My heart dropped. I thought I was gonna puke on the spot, but I didn't. I fumbled for the light switch by the sink without breaking eye contact and got a look, but it was nothing. Just the nightstand and a lamp. It rubbed me the wrong way. I just couldn't get that gut feeling of dread to go away. You've heard paralyzed with fear but you don't really understand it until you can't move, breathe, or scream. But as everything, things fade with time. I never read the thread again and started working very early in the morning. So when I'd get up to leave my house, it would be quite dark. And that room, it's like the dark coming from that room is so pitch black, you can't even see through the doorway. It's been years and I still can't. Every time I look in that room, the hair on my whole body stands wrong. I can't stop looking over my shoulder when I'm in the kitchen after dark, even when my whole family is awake with me. In the daytime, I can't go out there comfortably. I just feel like there's something right behind me, always just out of view, but behind me, even to reach in there to flip the light on. I'm scared, irrationally, that a hand will come out from the dark and grab me. I've started closing that door and keep it shut 24 seven, no matter what I do, it always seems to end up open, mostly because my mother sets her bag down there after work, but some days, even after I've shut it, it's cracked open, and I can't explain it. I would say I'm not paranoid of David anymore, although that particular story still terrifies me. I do absolutely believe in it and respect that entity. I don't think he ever was in my home. I think I was just afraid. But what could I have seen, and why did it leave such a lasting impact on me? It's gotten to the point of fearing the dark in that room, that it's traveled onto others. When I come down the stairs in the morning, I shut the door to the workspace slash office when I use the bathroom. I check the shower for anything slash anyone before locking myself in the bathroom, even when I'm home alone. In the dark, it just seems like that room itself holds something scary and that it could travel to any of the darkest rooms in the house. Even my bedroom has lights all night that could stay on. My whole point in sharing this is to get insight on what could be going on. 
than why that one room could form a paranoia of every dark room in the house. Why I can no longer even look at the door without feeling uncomfortable and that something's watching me. Could the story have really left me that scared without involving me? Or could I have done something, maybe had such an emotional reaction that it lured something to me? In late 2006, two strange events occurred on my first deployment to Iraq. A little background. The base we were on was near Iskandariya. It was a four smokestack power plant on the Euphrates River. It was like the military just walled off a one by one kilometer box around it. At the time, I think there were 800 personnel on the base, not including the Iraqis that ran the plant. There were paved streets, stop signs, nighttime street lights. The enemy rarely tried attacking it with mortars or rockets because they didn't want to screw up their power. It supposedly powered one third of Iraq. When we first landed there on the LZ, we thought they dropped us in a town and not an FOB. It was different than what you expect an FOB to look like. Everyone stayed in what we called cans, tin two person units. In the northeast corner of their FOB, however, my small specialized unit stayed in two houses. In the southwest corner, away from most of the personnel, one of the houses was pretty generic. But right next to it, the other was a mini mansion, which we referred to as the Taj Mahal. It had about eight rooms, most with their own bathroom, including shower. There was a kitchen and a dining room too. It was decorated with marble floors, wood accents, gold chandeliers, and one nice carpet. The upper floor rooms had balconies that overlooked the Euphrates River but the windows were sandbagged off due to the line of sight across it. It was pretty awesome thinking back. The rumor was that Saddam used it when he visited the plant, but my guess was that it was just an exaggeration and it was used by visiting VIPs. So here's where it gets weird. Myself and another guy called John shared an upstairs bedroom. When the lights were off, the room was completely dark. One morning after we were both waking up, he asked if I saw who came into the room last night and used our bathroom. Whoever it was, it didn't wake me and I'm a pretty light sleeper. John said someone wearing PT shorts, a tan undershirt, flip flops and red lenses came in and used our restroom and left without saying a word. The clothing description is what most guys slept in. The next morning we asked around and no one fessed up, which was weird because we're a pretty tight knit group and there was an abundance of working bathrooms in the Taj. So a few weeks or maybe months later, it's pretty much the same scenario. John and I are asleep in the middle of the night in a pitch black room and I'm awoken by a medic who's calling my name, who's clear as day in a pitch black room. He says, Hey man, they need you downstairs with a huge grin on his face. I'm awake and my eyes are open and I respond with what's going on. Mid sentence, my medic just completely disappears and I shout, which wakes up John, who I tell what happened. Nothing like that has ever happened since. Same deployment. One night there was a legit UFO sighting on multiple bases reported and I actually saw it. The only way I could describe it, it was like a cone shaped light in the sky pointy side down. It was like a high powered flashlight was hovering above it, 500 feet pointing straight up. You couldn't make anything out besides the off white cone of the light. No clue, whatever came of that. I met Carter at a convention. Right off the bat, he scared me. I heard rumors that he'd nearly been removed from the extremely liberal convention. But he seemed nice enough and lonely. So I decided to befriend him instead. Then I noticed that he was always nearby. When I was walking to my hotel, he was there. 
When I was eating lunch, he was there. When I was in my private group, he waited outside the door. When I went to meetings, he was there too and sat beside me. He usually either walked up to me and started a conversation, which ended in an awkward silence, or just stared at me from 50 yards away. I couldn't believe he was really following me. So I went to my hotel, disguised myself, and went outside to see if he was there. He was, literally lurking in the trees nearby. He pressured me into giving him my number, so I gave him a fake one. He found my professional information and begged me to look over his work, to which I declined. He asked me if I'd be at a party. I lied and said no. He showed up anyway. Somehow he knew I decided to go. He always talked about how lonely and depressed he was and how I was a lifeline until on my way home from the convention. I had no service during the flight. He freaked out and spammed 49 messages until ending with, okay, fine, I'm gonna end myself now, just so you know, strongly implying that it was my fault for not answering him immediately. I told him to call 911 and then blocked him. He contacted me through Instagram, hangouts, email and more, but I never replied. I asked the convention security to speak with him about his creepy behavior, and I was told to just switch off my phone. Fast forward a few months, I get an email from James asking me to look over his work. Not a big deal. I run a program specifically for this sort of thing. I agreed, since his email was very polite and well-worded, but he seemed pushy in a way I couldn't quite figure out. I ignored it, reviewed his work, and ceased communication. You know where this is going. A little while later, he confessed that it was Carter all along. He put all the blame on me and apologized in a horribly manipulative way, begging me once again to review his work. I never replied, and here we are. James slash Carter, let's never meet again. Five years ago, I was a dealer. Nothing big. I sold about 3K of the green stuff. Normally, my dealer would come to my apartment and give me 100 kilos, but he didn't have that much, so I had to drive to the next big city to get more. So me and two friends went to Stuttgart to meet a friend of mine. He lived in a social apartment, which was paid from our country. It was a big house with at least 50 little apartments. It was like a guest toilet. There was a big bed and a TV right in front of it, nothing more. It was the smallest room to live in I'd ever seen in my life. On the bed, there's a topless guy, pierced and skinny as hell. Completely on speed, bumping around the bed, watching a blue screen on the TV and listening to hard trance. The room was a complete mess, medication and cigarettes everywhere. I was scared to sit on the bed and didn't want to sit on a needle or anything, but I did it anyway. We spoke a bit about how it's going and stuff, and he told us that he was robbed two days ago and showed us the weed and mollies. Weed was in a tobacco box on the floor and the molly on top of it. Two minutes later, there was a knock on the door when a little 16 year old kid appeared and then vanished. All of a sudden, the door rips open and then two of the biggest guys I've ever seen came in, screaming at us and telling us to get on the floor. I wasn't sure what was happening. They were wearing weird combat clothes, as well as having weapons under their belts. Why are you dealing on our boss's territory? They said. Me and my friend sitting next to each other looked on the floor completely dazed and froze. I liked... They searched the room for everything and took it all from him, slapped him in the face and screamed at him. At the same time, in my hands and in my jacket, I had 2,000 euros, hoping they wouldn't find it. Suddenly, one of them grabbed a Coca-Cola bottle and told them to turn around, but the other said they had no time and they left. Scared as hell, we looked at each other completely out of our minds and said nothing. They must have been high as well. Unfortunately for them, they didn't see what was actually in the middle of the room in the boxes. 
so our deal was good to go anyway. The only thing I was worried about were the two Goliaths waiting for us to come out. So the dealer guy called a friend who was living in the same house to protect us while we left, but nobody was out there when we drove home safely. My other friend waited outside and screamed at us for waiting that long. I almost hit him in the face when I told him the story which he didn't believe at first, but we insisted it was true. I hoped to never see those guys again, and I'd stopped doing this after that. It's so scary. Just over a year ago, I split up with a very abusive ex-boyfriend, Kieran. He would be physically, verbally, and otherwise aggressive, and seemed constantly paranoid of being emasculated. This progressed to being paranoid about me even earning as much as him. I tried to be clear that I saw him as an equal, but it didn't matter. He fell further and further into the philosophy that women are the root of all evil, if ever there was a living, breathing caricature of genuine misogyny, he was it. I'm not a fighter, and he hated it. As he put it, the silence, the open void, hurts me more. He wanted me to fight back, but I never would. So, he would go to greater and greater lengths to assert dominance over me in one way or another. One incident was so extremely violent and calculated that I eventually reported it to the police, and with the help of an off-duty cop, due to the nature of the assault, it went straight to Crown Court, which is reserved for the worst offences in the UK. Nothing came of it. No eyewitnesses. It wouldn't have gone anywhere. I pressed it no further. I just wanted it marked up to help any future partners build a case that puts him away if it ever happens again. This was the incident that tipped me towards making the decision to leave Kieran. It took some months, but I eventually did it. He made so many attempts to contact me that even the officers on my case raised an eyebrow. It was getting beyond borderline harassment. Long story short, this guy was not happy that he had lost me. He didn't care about my well-being. He cared about having me. I don't think I understand why to this day. Kieran kept vying for attention. He likes women of my political persuasion, and as I was known as an outspoken activist at the time, he began name-dropping my messages to other women in the same political circles. I thought that maybe he didn't think we knew each other at first, but then he started messaging friends. I tried to be cordial with all former partners, including him. So when he messaged me asking if another activist we followed was still online, I told him she was. Big mistake. Within the hour, she DM'd me. She received aggressive messages from him demanding photos and then demanding an explanation as to why she wouldn't oblige, because Kieran was my nice ex. I quickly told all other young female activists at my university in my hometown and my local party associations. Almost all came back to me saying they had indeed received messages from him. He was hounded off Twitter by a friend's boyfriend and deleted his account. I know how that feels, and I feel bad for it, but I don't regret the act of warning my friends, especially the more vulnerable ones. But then a new account was made, Kieran Mate 97 I only noticed because the first notification I remember getting the morning after was that this account had followed me. It had a photo of Kieran and a few sunny tweets shared by my fellow followers about how he was new to Twitter and wanted some friends. I spread the warning to some people and blocked the account, but before long there was another. I did the same and blocked them too. My mother started messaging me in confusion, sending me screenshots from her own Twitter. Kieran had found her anonymous account and was asking her about beans she had bought the other day, knowing the things Kieran had said about her to me and possibly others. She was upset and creeped out beyond compare. I advised she blocked him and he would tie himself out eventually. But there's one thing that I need to mention. One night I was messaging friends, having a nice night in with the housemates. Then my WhatsApp pinged. 
All of my family are on there as well as a few busy activist groups, so I didn't think anything of it. Because of all the activist groups too, I wasn't alarmed that it was an unsaved number that had messaged me. It was probably a colleague. I opened the message. The only thing there was was a dark photo of a house with an upstairs light on. I squinted to try and see if there was a joke in the photo. Why would someone send me this? I could see a figure in the window hunched over, something small in their hand. I could see the end of the terrace, the hedges, the shape of the gate, the pebble dash, the light car out front. It was my house. I forgot my merriment and messaged my friends. The conversation completely derailed, understandably. We scrambled to figure out who sent this to me, but by the time the second picture came in, I already knew. I didn't even look at it. Most of my uni friends at the time were competitive weightlifters, and they offered their house a safe refuge until I figured out what was happening. I sent a frantic, what are you doing, to Kieran, and he began typing immediately. He had been waiting. Peeking, he replied. It was a joke. Can you see that shadow? I'm not a bloody peeping Tom. I thought it was a joke when you first scared me crapless, but now I can't make sense of it. Oh no, that was just me actually watching my neighbor's shadow eating a pot noodle for entertainment, as if I'd come for you. You know how I think better than anyone. I examined the second picture closely. It wasn't mine. It looked very much like it. He hasn't messaged me since. No communication at all. I still don't understand what the purpose of that whole exercise was. I stayed in my house and left in the early afternoon for a friend's place the next day. For months afterwards, I was very careful about letting my landlady, neighbors, and friends know I was coming home. The doors and windows were always locked. I really don't know how he thinks. I hope I never see him again. I was a Navy sailor who went out to sea many times for weeks at a time. One of my jobs was being a lookout to spot boats, planes, and things in the water or air pretty much and report it back to the ship. My lookout rotation could have me standing watch during the day or nights, sometimes both. And it was during the night where I was pretty afraid, especially if you were at the back of the ship alone. For anyone who hasn't been out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night, you should realize you see many more lights in the sky than you ever would in the city. And on Navy ships, they feel like they have very little lights on at night. So standing around at 1 a.m. feels very alien. And during the nights, without a bright moon to help with your vision, you may as well be on a different planet. There was this one time I saw a bright green color moving in the water slowly and it didn't know what it was. My mind told me it maybe was a USO or something. Eventually, I was told it was just plankton, but it sure was freaky for someone who wasn't aware of the phenomena. Another time me and another guy were standing watch together and I decided to just look up during 2 a.m. and see what I could see. And when I looked at the midnight sky, I could see meteors streaking across it. A few times there were bright lights moving out the way. Maybe satellites, who knows? But I stared at it for a good 20 minutes. And at about 15 minutes, slow moving lights in different areas of the sky, perhaps very far apart, started moving. Either way. Those were the few times I saw for myself how vast space really is, and that there was just so many things unknown to humans that we have yet to discover. I'm 25, and I currently went back to living in my mum's house temporarily, as I recover from a nasty relationship. About a week ago, my mum and I were talking, and she was telling me about her rough childhood, I knew my mum once messed with a Ouija board when she was younger, but I thought it was just the once. To my surprise, she told me she was a medium. She constantly spoke with the dead when she had the chance. She had my half-brothers at 16, and she messed around with the paranormal. My grandma also had my mum when she was 16, and did the same thing of speaking with the dead and practicing witchcraft. 
and I guess it also showed my mum. My grandma was horrible to my mother. She neglected her, abused her, and even left her starving and ate in front of her. My mum said grandma didn't know any better, and so my mum wanted to mess around with the paranormal for the tension. I think she felt very attached to speaking with the dead. Years passed by, and she's currently a Jehovah's Witness, and has been for 20 years. In 1994, I was born, and I was born into their religious beliefs. In my opinion, my childhood was rough because of their religious beliefs pushed onto me. Little did I know I was today years old, realizing that my mum was running away from her curse. She feels protected by her religious beliefs and did not let the paranormal entities bother her. That, and I mean she had a rough childhood and tried to look for God. My youngest half-brother always tells my mum that he is always being bothered by ghosts. He tells us his stories every time he comes over to visit. I wonder, did my mum have a curse on her side of the family? But how come I never had anything happen to me? Not that I wish I can see something scary, but I noticed I've never had a paranormal experience in my life. Never seen a ghost, nor demon, nor anything that goes bump in the night. Well, maybe one bump, but I feel like it can be explained by a cat. The closest thing I had to an experience was when I was outside leaning against my car with my boyfriend at the time having a cigarette and reminiscing the scary scenes after watching a horror movie at the theater. We were both caught off guard when suddenly the neighbor's house across the street had its mailbox door swivel open. There was no one around and there was no wind, and yet, I feel like my boyfriend had this aura of bad luck or attracted a spirit that bothered him. Why I say that? Because he told me he also had paranormal experiences alone, but he believes it's on the land he lives on. Another time I had sleep paralysis, which I'm not sure if it relates to the paranormal, but I was on summer break, 16, and I'm used to my mom waking up early and go to take her to work for her housekeeping job. She would pay me cash for helping her. Waking up at seven was painful and many times I would end up not going. She usually would knock on my bedroom door loudly, yell my name and tell me to get up. All of a sudden I wake up, but I'm only half awake. I can't move, but I can see my bedroom door. I see a shadowy figure opening the door, the same shape of my mum, and she's walking around me slowly, but talking to me in her voice. The figure got close to me at my bedside, and it was like my chest was being pushed down and I couldn't breathe. Then I woke up and went down the hallway and my mum said she was downstairs the whole time and about to leave for work. I refuse to let curiosity get the best out of me and try speaking to the dead. But does this mean I am not cursed or do I have a strong aura? Do I have good luck? Do I have a strong soul? I don't really know. I also have a story my mum wanted to share. My mum knows when I low key watch horror movies in our home because at night time she feels bothered or has some sort of anxiety build up, like a presence watching her. My grandma took people's photos and put curses on them. For example, she had a male friend who his girlfriend was trying to leave him. My grandma got mad and took a photo of both of them and did like this, binding spell so they stay together forever. The girl never left him, but is in an unhappy relationship and does not know why she keeps coming back. They're still together to this day. My mum was sleeping on the couch and she woke up to her dad's bedroom door, shaking and trembling, each second more loud. Then the sound of the hands slamming against the door. She yelled and the noise stopped. She checked if her dad was around and she came through the door saying he was outside the whole time. My mom's sister did witchcraft. My mother took her witchcraft book away and tried to destroy it outside. She took a match to it and tried to light it on fire, but it didn't burn. So she tossed it off a cliff and said that no one would ever find it. When out of nowhere, it came flying down at them. They ran away and never returned for the book. During the time of her being a Jehovah's Witness, she wanted to help people who were studying Bible to stop some minor paranormal activity in her home. She visited them and saw books flying like birds. She ran away and the couple moved out and sold the house. My mom said that one time in her 20s, she was sleeping alone in her home and she felt a big hand grope her and go down on her. Then. She lifted the bedsheet for no one to be there. 
One night she was sleeping and my half-brothers of five and seven had to go potty in the middle of the night. The oldest was helping his youngest brother go, and the youngest said angrily, I can't go, there's a small guy with a huge hat, staring and smiling next to the toilet. My oldest brother said he couldn't see anything. They both went to tell my mum next morning, and it turns out she'd been playing with a Ouija board with her sister and brother, and her two sons were sitting and watching. There was a moment when she felt half her face and body just go numb. She doesn't remember saying anything, but she thinks she got possessed for a split second. Her brother was next to her on the Ouija, when he said in Spanish, Que miras clavos? Translation, what are you looking at, nails? Staring at my mum's oldest son with a sinister smile. My mum's brother bowed his head and came back to normal. She didn't remember what happened. My mum was freaking out because her uncle who passed away was the only one who called her oldest son Clavos. That nickname was given to my brother because his hair was so thick. So when he got a haircut, his hair would stick out like a bunch of nails. I'm currently serving in the army and I'm stationed in Hawaii in the Schofield barracks. I had a long day and decided I'd have something to drink since it was early enough in the day that I could get to sleep and wake up sober for morning formation, laying in bed, watching Reddit stories on YouTube when I fell asleep much earlier than I usually do by accident and thus not setting my alarm for the next day. Any person in the military can tell you that missing morning formation is a big no-no. So there's a lamp in my closet that was sitting on a shelf above my head level and has been there since I got my room. I suddenly awake to the lamp falling off the shelf and hitting the floor, but not scaring me. Like I said, I was just awakened by it. Thinking to myself that it's weird, but also remembering that I haven't set my alarm for the next day, I open my clock app and start setting them when out of the corner of my eye, I see a wispy white figure walk past me. I quickly dart my eye to see it and poof, nothing there. Again, none of this scared me as something like this usually would and I found a comfort in believing it was a guardian angel walking to me to have me set my alarm. So I didn't get into trouble for missing formation. What did freak me out, however, is after I closed the door and went back to sleep, about two minutes into me laying back down, I heard a loud meow coming from the closet. I jumped immediately, turned on my lights and swung my closet door open to find nothing. Barracks do not allow pets or animals. And for those thinking maybe the lamp just fell on its own, there's no discernible reason it would have, as it's pretty far back on the shelf and hadn't been moved or touched since I got there about a month ago and had never fallen before. I had a long talk with my dad last night about the house I grew up in. I lived there from about age six to 15. I'm 21 now. Apparently the previous owner was a recluse and mentally ill. He chose to end his life with a shotgun in my bedroom, next to the window. There's a bleached spot there on the hardwood floor that I had always covered up with a chair his brother would check on him periodically, but this time he didn't for about three weeks. Then came over and found him dead. My dad found this out after we moved in. He said a police officer came up to him when he was doing yard work and said, don't let the history of this place scare you. It's a beautiful property. And my dad was like, what? Needless to say, I'm creeped out. I don't remember ever feeling unsafe in the house, but the lock on my door had locked itself numerous times during the first year we lived there. I vividly remember being locked inside there with my friend one day, and firefighters had to come and pull us out the window. After that, my father just straight up took the doorknob off, so I had no doorknob growing up. There were also crosses above my sister and I's door that I never really questioned, but apparently my dad had a priest come over and bless the doorway. This affected my dad a lot. 
One day he was doing roof work on a ladder, right outside my window, perfectly in control. When the ladder folded and slipped sideways and he fell 10 feet and almost died. And when my parents got divorced and my mum took my sister and I to live elsewhere, my dad lived there alone for two years. He said it got so disturbing he finally had to move. He said that when he came home from work at night through the basement, it would reek of smoke. The man was a smoker when alive. The scent was so strong, he was convinced on several occasions that someone had broken in. But then my dad would go upstairs and come back down as a test, and the smell would be gone. I'm just a little spooked finding out that I lived in a room where this had happened, especially since I had my own attempt in that same room. Just kind of a mind blow. Does anyone else have like positive stories of this kind of spirit moving on after or something like that? I'm having a hard time processing all of this and really hope that the man is at rest now. How this all began was me being nice to the people who come to my local community library. I was a casual worker, although people probably thought I was a part-timer, as not only was I spotted behind the desk checking in and out books, but also on my laptop abusing the Wi-Fi. This guy nicknamed Chesney was probably an influencer for the young adults, as he mainly skateboarded around and did whatever. He was never alone. I was a natural when it comes to customer service speaking and acting, so chances are I must have spoken to Chesney kindly enough. He thought I was interested in him, or he became infatuated with me. I don't date anyone in or from my community. I explained to many people before that dating here would be full on Alabama. Chances are they could be my cousin through marriage or blood. It's disturbing as I'm Native American and can't even go west or south to date another guy because chances are they might also be a long distance cousin. While my time at the library was long, just to gain work experience, it did not last when Chesney asked me to hang out with him. I declined the first time, but it didn't stop. One day he asked for my phone number and I refused. I don't give out personal information like that. I have a low friend count. I'm not close to anyone who isn't within my immediate family. And my family can see BS as soon as it comes into their line of sight. Chesney then asked my supervisor for my number to give to him. How I came to know this is by the end of the day when we were closing up the library. My supervisor tells me that she'll keep an eye on him and that I should get home safely. I continue every day as normal, very ignorant of the situation that was now starting to build. One day I was sitting in my cubby hole, as the patrons like to call it, and I started to notice Chesney would find a spot to sit where I would be in his line of sight. I ignored this until one day he came up to my cubby hole and hands me this Magic the Gathering card. He didn't say much, but I was disturbed. I'll be honest, something about him didn't seem right. The card had an octopus on it. And then, right then and there, I placed the card down and gather up my things and leave. I didn't return to the library for three months, maybe even longer than that. This had taken place two years ago. I told my eldest sister about the incident and my family were worried. They wanted to know the guy's name. However, I did not want to know his name. I didn't see him being important to remember. I didn't see him again until a year later. I'm doing more casual work at the library and basically forgot his face until one day he comes in and was working at a computer. I never gave him a second thought. I was busy reorganizing and stacking the bookshelves. Then he printed off a paper and came up to me and asked, how do you get a job here at the library? My reply was blunt. You have to speak with my supervisor. I overheard my supervisor telling him he couldn't hand him his resume here, that he needs to hand it in over at HR at the band office. 
Never saw him again, as I've got a job elsewhere. Two years later, about four days ago, I'm living my life as normal when my mum texts me. Hey, some guy's calling you and would like to speak to you. Is there no number to call back? Not my time. Eh, didn't call my number. Not worth a call back, mum. I just answered the phone. I said I'd just pass the message on. She gives me the caller ID. But, like an ass, I text her back saying the ID isn't familiar and there's no number to call back from. If someone wanted to speak to me, they would call or text me through my cell. Otherwise, it can't be important. And I ignore it. I was sitting at my local Timmy's when my eldest sister calls me and tells me that I have a stalker. It shook me a bit, but another part of me was amused, since I do have a tendency to think dark thoughts, and that this could be a joke. My sister explained to me that my stalker wanted to meet with me, and take me out to dinner, that he wanted to hang out with me. She wasn't saying this seriously, which is why I thought she was joking. I didn't know who this guy was, and I tried to place a name and face to whoever this person was. Things were starting to get a bit annoying when my mum and elder sister started to accuse me of giving out my brother's number to a stranger. Why the hell would I do that? I barely have a social life. Whose number would I be giving it out to? When I went home, I went over to my brother's house. My mum, who was staying there, said he just called. Now my family's on high alert. By reverse number searching, I got an address where the number was coming from. I wasn't taking this seriously. Whoever they are, they lived outside the res. Me and my elder sister went to the address and did a drive-by. My sister enlightened up the mood by making jokes, pointing out to random guys who were walking down the road saying, Oh, that must be your stalker. No, that one. Just saying, these guys walking around the road looked like your typical druggy or tweakers. Once we returned home, my amusement ended, as the accusations started up again if I gave out my brother's number, being a concern. My elder sister asked and demanded to know, but of course I had not done that. Then how did your stalker get it? She asked. Well, he either got it from someone who knows our brother's home phone number or looked it up in the phone book, is what I concluded, as I know for damn sure I never gave out anyone's number. Once I got home, I was annoyed, immediately grabbed my brother's handphone and went outside to call this guy. My sister was walking to my other brother, filling him in on what was going on. It didn't take long for the guy to pick up. You can guess who it was. Chesney. Chesney was the one calling my brother's home and asking for me. I immediately started to tell him my family isn't amused, and that I wasn't interested. Even when I said no, he kept on trying to ask me out. So I asked for his forename, which he gave, and told my siblings who it was. It's not my fault for living under a rock. Turns out this guy's an addict, if not a loser. And I told my parents and they told me to not even think of dating him and to just go and leave him alone. Thanks, mum and dad. I don't date anyone from the res. I did do a Facebook search and of course he had to be a wannabe thug. Honest about doing hardcore drugs in his post. And I love that he has German blood saying he's a Nazi and a descendant of the Fuhrer. Nice. Getting up, I went to my brother's house who was home, annoyed, and I couldn't find the phone on the cradle. I asked my brother, who went to the incoming calls, pressed the number and handed it to me, which I immediately pressed call. And this guy didn't wait to pick up the phone. Chesney? Speaking. I was pissed and didn't use my customer service voice. That was gone. You will cease and desist from calling this number ever again, or I will get the police involved. This is a form of harassment. Uh, okay. I hung up, furious. My mother said something about calling the cops, but he was calling my brother's phone, not mine directly, and he hadn't done anything threatening yet. But still, I really hope not to meet that guy again. Pathetic, worthless, and annoying. Somewhere in 2007, I was stationed in Camp Pendleton, specifically Camp Horner. I was acting as officer of the day. 
The command post is a long building about half the length of a football field with a long hallway going all the way down. Our office is dead center next to the stairs. Around 1.30 a.m., I heard footsteps upstairs. Knowing I was the only person awake in the building, as my assistant was sleeping in the bed provided in the duty hut, I went to investigate. I checked all the rooms and found no one or nothing, and came back down to my post, and my assistant duty was awake and rushing to put his boots on. I asked him what was wrong and he exclaimed he heard a faint scream from down the hall. We both checked the entire perimeter and found nothing. Once we went back to the post, we heard what sounded like a door toggle furiously upstairs for three seconds, and the rest of the night was quiet. I reported the events to my superiors who laughed it off and said it was dark. We found out these buildings were pre-World War II and supposedly a Navy corpsman failed to save a life of a Marine and ended his own life upstairs. Never confirmed the story to be true, but the events sure convinced me. I am a sensitive. I have seen and experienced the paranormal since I was little. My experiences range from surprising to scary and can happen any time. I don't control it. The one thing I can count on though is something almost always happens to me around Halloween. I'm sure most people know that Halloween is the time where the veil between the worlds is thinnest. It's not just that day. Sometimes as much as two weeks before and after Halloween, the veil is thin enough to severely affect sensitives. I have a few sensitive friends and know that some can even feel the veil thinning. Responses to the veil range depend on sensitivity and I have experienced lucid dreaming, vivid dreams and severe anxiety. I do have anxiety which I medicate for and last Halloween I had a panic attack come out of nowhere. I was shaking and could hardly breathe for no reason. I barely made it back to the car. I know it was because of the veil. I don't usually have those attacks since starting my medicine, and I went back to the same mall a few months later to experience no anxiety. I don't remember everything that happens on Halloween, so the experiences I do remember are usually among the scariest. I will start with the one that happened the longest time ago. That Halloween I had a few things happen to me as expected. I can't remember them since they didn't really stand out. This experience was more creepy than scary. It was either Halloween night or just after. I couldn't sleep, so I was playing on my phone in the dark. I decided it was time to make myself sleep. So I went to put my phone down, and when I did, I saw a dark cat-sized shadow jumping to my face. I jerked back, thinking it was my black cat, and that it had jumped from the nightstand to my bed. I never felt her land on the bed. I looked around for her just to realize she was asleep on the other side of my bed. She would have had to climb over me to lay there from that angle. It took me a while to sleep that night. This next one is my sister's experience. It happened either the same year or a little after. She isn't as sensitive as I am, so her experiences are fewer but stand out more. She was riding home with her boyfriend from the Halloween gathering they'd gone to. It was dark, of course, when he pulled into the driveway to our house. She said the lights landed on something large running on all fours. It was humanoid shaped. He didn't see it. She told me about it and I told her it was fine. She was inside and I told her not to go outside again that night. Last Halloween was my most active one. It was a week or so before my panic attack. I also had several lucid dreams and one very vivid dream that I still cannot convince myself was just a dream. I saw so much more than ghosts. I have a job that requires me to go to customers' houses to try and contact with them. I was doing what I was supposed to do when these two incidents occurred. I can't remember if they happened or not on the same night. It was just before Halloween and I was on dimly lit back roads in my small town. In my town, most of the back roads are dark so I was lucky to have some extra light. I rounded a curve and my lights lit up something standing on the other side of a fence. It was a gray mass that seemed almost two dimensional. The best way to describe it would be almost like the reports of Bigfoot. It was taller than a human, 
but shaped similarly. It was not Bigfoot, though. It had no definition to it, and I believe it belonged to a different place. I drove faster after seeing it, and took a different road back. The next thing I saw was very similar to the previous creature except it flew. I was in my own car with the way the windshield slants, and I only saw it for a moment. It was almost like a pterodactyl, but was grey and had no definition like the other one. I describe it that way for lack of a better way. Obviously I don't think we have extinct flying dinosaurs in my small town of Tennessee. These creatures sound absurd, I know, and even I would have had a hard time believing someone when they described them. My last experience of that Halloween was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I was pulling into my driveway at night after getting off work. It was late, and everyone else would have gone to bed by then. It was the first time I had seen anything like it, and hopefully the last. I understand why my sister freaked out that time. A large humanoid creature on all fours was running through the yard. It was only a few seconds that I had seen it, but it was close. It was big, maybe twice the size of our chocolate lab. Once we passed each other, I didn't see it again. Needless to say, I made a mad dash into the house and wouldn't let the dogs out to use the bathroom. This happened last year at the university I currently attend. I met three friends, Sarah, Jill and Mike. Sarah and I met back in high school, who I ran into at college. We ended up rekindling our friendship. She told me a secret that she kept in high school, that she was a lesbian and was out, and introduced me to her girlfriend Jill and their friend Mike. When we all ate in the school's dining hall, the four of us kind of became pretty close and ended up meeting and hanging out as a group frequently. Even though there was a little drama between Mike and Sarah, because both have a thing for Jill and would occasionally get jealous or try to impress her. Mike brought up to me that him and Jill actually had a cuddle session in her dorm room, which Sarah didn't know about at the time. I have to admit, I also had a thing for Jill. She had a nice smile, pink hair, and a sweet, positive Johnny personality that attracted a lot of people. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, myself, Mike, Sarah and Jill made it a habit to have a weekly hangout, late at night. I was the only one with a vehicle, so we would go riding around in my truck. We'd leave around 8pm and would not be back until 3am. We'd drive around town, just riding or walking to the downtown area and occasionally to stop and grab snacks, or at a local store that was open or even another friend's house, where Sarah and Jill could get high for the night. One night around 2am, we passed a local park that's pretty popular, and Jill playfully yelled for us to go to the park. I was a little skeptical about the idea at first, but the majority overruled as everyone seemed excited about the idea. When we pulled up at the park, it was pretty spooky. It was dark and didn't seem like the great place to be at this time of night. Jill was the first person to jump out of the truck along with Sarah and me. Mike was not far behind. Me and Sarah headed over to the swings while Mike and Jill ran around and played on the playground equipment like five-year-old kids. Near the park was a large sitting area and in the distance I could see two dark figures and I pointed them out to Sarah. We assumed they were homeless people because the park is normally infested with them. They kept watching us over the fence behind the woods, and I could hear someone walking through. This was getting creepy, and Sarah also felt the same way, and we yelled at Jill and Mike, who were having a great time on the slide that we were leaving. We left, and apparently those ten minutes were so good that the majority insisted we come back the next day. The next night comes around, and we do our usual routine. It's 2.30am, and we're at the park again. This time, there are more homeless people coming out of the woods who look pretty creepy. Jill again was the first to jump out of the truck and say, Are you coming, kids? We're gonna have a fun day again, in her excited voice. So we go to the play area and apparently what we didn't notice is that we were trespassing as the park opening hours were over. But the gate was still open, so we proceeded anyway. Me and Sarah were again on the swings watching our backs and looking for any suspicious activity, while Mike and Jill were playing on the monkey bars. 
Ten minutes later, a grey car pulls up at the end of the fence and just sat there. Me and Sarah looked at each other and we watched it for about half a minute. The lights in the car came on for a quick second and we could see there were three men in there but we couldn't get a good look. They sat there then slowly drove around to the entrance of the gate. Jill and Mike both looked at me and Sarah was worried. This seemed highly suspicious because no one would be at this park at this time of night unless they were homeless and looking for a place to sleep or do something else. As the car got closer, I demanded everyone to head to the truck. The four of us all ran and the faster we ran, the faster the car drove to the entrance of the gate. We jumped into my truck and drove away and we could see the car following us for a certain distance and then we lost it. We were all pretty creeped out and shaken up and we still avoid that park to this day. I told another friend about this incident and he wasn't very surprised. He said that the neighborhood and area that surrounds the park are known to have a high crime rate, especially that late at night. I told this to Sarah, Jill and Mike. And to this day, we always ask the question, what would have happened if we'd have stayed or got caught? So to the individuals in the gray car, let's not meet again. I have a few stories to share. One is from my current command, MBK Bangor in Washington. There's a story that a long time ago, this little Indian girl was found by this guy and he elected to end her life after subjecting her to horrific travesties. The man who owned this land before it was made into a base was the one who did it. The creepy thing is that her burial site is on the land deep within the woods. When I was taking classes to drive an armored vehicle, we had to do night driving and the off-road course goes very close to the site. The sergeant who was operating my second set of eyes looks to the right side of the vehicle and told me to stop. It's pitch black and I can't see anything without my night vision goggles and think the sergeant is just trying to mess with me. The two other vehicles stop behind us and get out asking what's up. The sergeant says he saw something in the woods when we were driving. It was out of my line of sight, so I didn't see it, but the sergeant was very spooked. The vehicle behind us started talking about the girl and a marine that ended his life 10 years ago. I'm not a believer in any of this, so I just say let's finish because it's already 2 a.m. And then we go through the course a second time. At this point, I'm a passenger and the sergeant is in the back while a callman drives. I saw some stuff the entire time and said nothing. I asked around a bit and that's when I found out it was a burial site. The thing I saw was about four feet tall and looked like a small person in tall random clearings in the woods. Definitely not shadows. And I don't think it was the NVD malfunctioning, but it definitely looked real. I've had other people go on this course and experience similar things also. I was accused of being a stalker. Did I do what I was accused of? Yes. But let me take you to how this started. I was home making dinner. The only three other people that were in the house were my five-year-old son, his friend, and our foreign exchange student, Tina, who was 15 and extremely shy and didn't like talking because she didn't think she spoke English very well. I'm making dinner as I said and have my hands buried in a meatloaf and the phone rings. I wipe my hands and onto the phone and some lady's yelling at me. I can't understand her. She keeps yelling. And I got the words, son, police, kick, ass. She hung up. And I was standing there with the phone in my mostly wiped hand, very confused. I resumed my meatloaf when the phone rang again. It was the same lady who was a little calmer and said, stop calling here. My son doesn't want anything to do with you. I already called the police. And I said, you've been calling me. I didn't call you. I don't even know who you are. The police will contact you and throw you in jail. I hope you rot in there. I didn't know what this lady was doing or where she was getting her information from. I was making dinner. My son was playing with a friend in the next room and Tina was studying. Later the same day, the police department called asking if they could come over and speak with me. We set up a time and I'm almost in tears. Keep in mind I'm in my mid thirties and didn't even pull pranks when I was young. I was one who always followed the rules and taught my kids the same thing. 
and now I'm being accused of being a stalker? This may not seem scary, but I was terrified, thinking this lady is going to have me thrown in jail without so much as an explanation from me. Not that I had one. I was confused. Two officers pull up and I open the door. They asked me to lock up my dogs as I had three Great Danes at the time. So I lock them up out back and come back to the door and tell them to come in. The kids were at the neighbor's house because I didn't want them to see me being arrested if it came to that. We sit at the kitchen table and I get them each a bottle of water with them asking about who lives here and where they are and I'm sitting there shaking visibly. I'm so nervous, my mouth is dry and I can't swallow and I can barely speak. Just then my husband comes home. He's the one who can talk anyone calm and practically could sell oil to Saudi Arabia. He's so smooth. He's talking to the officers and even though he wasn't here, he knows I'm not stalking anyone and that these accusations are ridiculous. They say the person said I called them and hung up. I said I was making a meatloaf and answered the phone with meatloaf residue on my hands and some lady began yelling at me. And I only understood some police kick and ass and she hung up and then she called back. And I understood her better and she said that I was going to jail and her son didn't want anything to do with me. And finally, the officer says, well, I don't think you had anything to do with this, but she has your number. So someone called. Do you think your kids have anything to do with this? I told him my little one was playing with a friend in the dining room, which I could see at all times and my foreign exchange student was studying at the time and she's quiet and there's no way she would stalk someone. Plus, I was right next to the phone. There was another phone in my bedroom and no one ever went there, so it couldn't have happened. They gave me the phone number I was supposed to have called and didn't recognize it. So they asked if they could speak to Tina, who was 15. She was shy and I didn't really want to scare her and they said they would just calmly speak to her. So I said, okay. She came out, sat at the table with us and they were asking her name, how she liked it there and if she made any friends and if she called any friends today. She said that she didn't, but then she said that she tried to call Jamie, but went over there instead, but came back home because everyone was upset about someone stalking their son. We came to find out she plugged an old phone into the jack in her room and it worked. So she called from there and she hung up after two rings because she decided to walk over there since they live four houses away. My neighbors were getting calls from one of their son's ex-girlfriends. And Tina just happened to call at the same time and they hit star six, nine and called my house thinking that I was the stalker. Now star six, nine was very new and I didn't know about it at the time. We had a huge laugh when the police called then told them that I was not the stalker. It was their neighbor who they knew and we were cool. I landed a summer job a few years ago while getting my bachelor's degree in history at the Winchester Mystery. For those of you who don't know, the Winchester House is an 160 room mansion built off land purchased by Sarah Winchester at the turn of the 19th century. That used to be an eight room farmhouse like any other in pre Silicon Valley. The owners of the place today a descendants of the Brown family who purchased the Victoria home in public auction. They have before claimed it to be the most haunted house in North America. I find the owners of it today to be shady, lucrative people. The admin slash owners treat us like tour guides and are we're on minimum wage. It is hardly a sustainable job if it wasn't for the tips and the nice folk and the generosity of them that they give us at the end of the tours. They typically hire six to 12 tour guides per year. As some do it seasonally and others retire. It's a balance between college slash grad students studying history or in theater programs and middle age plus elder folk who have been around for quite some time. The medical benefit from the job is if you get injured at the house, they will pay for all related medical expenses. That's about it from my time working there, which was within the past few years. My role as a tour guide was to coordinate my tours, which ranged from as little as three to 28 people on a 65 minute guided tour within an eight hour shift. So there'd be about four to six tours a day per guide. 
When I started out, I was given a week to explore the mansion on my own and get a look around. After being tested on a script written in part by the mansion historian, a full-time position held by a really nice lady, and recycled material from when tours began in the 1920s, I've explored at least 80% of the mansion, as some places are locked and really hard to get past, and I've had a handful of unexplainable occurrences. One notable instance is when I was giving a tour to 27 people. While in the 13th bathroom, which had the unfinished state-of-the-art shower, my tour delivery was interrupted by a very faint shriek that sounded as though it were coming down the halls from the switchback staircase. I asked if others had heard it and they said yes, which was quite strange. More eerie, but also, I really am not sure if it was my imagination. And during my second day of training, I walked up the fourth turn of the switchback staircase and thought I heard footsteps to the rhythm of a shadowy figure that suddenly creeped into the corner of my eye. As I walked up the shallow stairs, it was coming up from them and was well behind me. Imagination or not, I ran into the upstairs hay room, which is now a display room for artifacts as fast as I could. Apparently, seeing a shadowy womanly figure in black has been the complaint of others as well. Other things would happen, like a tour in front of me one time witnessed a photograph frame fall from a high shelf in the ballroom and shatter. The sudden smell of roses in Madame Sarah's dead room. Us guys called it the dead room, but the admins didn't wish guests to know that was the name we gave the room. The scariest experience of all was exploring the unlit attic, which is off limits and used for storage of decor. In between a tour break with my phone flashlight, the beautiful third floor window, which can be seen in nearly every online front picture of the mansion, is where I encountered a horrific grotesque figure in a woman's Victorian morning gown. Its hollow eyes and rotting face were literally set up at the window, holding a rose and pointing outwards. For a mere second, I seized in terror with my phone light fixed, for me to see it was a rubber poseable zombie decor used for spooky events. There were many memories made there. One of my favorite was giving tours to company hosted reservations. Open drinks aren't allowed in the house for purpose of preservation. Say you were to spill it. But when Google and other tech companies bought out the place for the night, the admins would turn a blind eye and ask those of us chosen to host and not ask them to put their drinks away. The employees of said companies were quite nice folk though, and were easy enough to get along with and to entertain. When I was in the Marines, I was deployed to Afghanistan in October 2011. I was on a forward operating base, Hansen for the first few months, and forward operating base Jackson for the last few months, before getting moved to Camp Leatherneck for the last few months, when our replacement showed up. My job was to operate the laundry service as well as provide clean water for showers. Technically not clean enough to drink, but you could, for US and Afghani troops. After the first few months or so on Hansen, whenever I tried to sleep, I could feel a hand grabbing at my calf and slowly work its way up. I immediately dismissed it as being a result from stress or sleep paralysis type thing, and it would kind of subside since it wasn't a very strong feeling at all. This happened for a night or two a week, but eventually stopped. Fast forwarding to when I was on Leatherneck, nothing happened when I was at Jackson, or even my short trip to Nalay, so I forgot about it. At this point, a lot of real life stuff had happened and I was having issues going to sleep, so I would play music in some earbuds, or I would rewatch a movie in my head. Basically anything to get my mind off the day's events. I slept in a room with two to four other people, so depending on who was there, I would try to be considerate, especially with the not ideal layout of the six or so bunk beds. There was an emergency exit sign above the door that glowed a soft orangey red. One of the nights when I was running something in my head, 
with me being 100% awake, eyes closed and no headphones. I heard two people talking. This was not something I would imagine at all, but I was curious since I could hear them quite clearly. The conversation in my head went something like this. Hi. Hey. What are you guys up to? We're just looking around. Where are you from? We work for Nying. You work for Nying? No, silly. And then I feel a slap on my sleeping bag. I immediately prop myself up on my elbow and look down at my sleeping bag, and there's a handprint on the fabric. Old, three-part, puffy sleeping system, where I felt the slap, and it was at an angle that no one in the room could have gotten at. The other two were passed out with headphones on, and on the other side of the room, there was no one else besides the three of us. At this point, I noped out for a smoke, and then I returned and put some headphones on and went to sleep. Two nights later, I had the worst dream to date. I hope it was a dream anyway. I woke up in my bed and noticed that the normal orange light was blue and there was a faint electrical buzz and there was a figure standing in the light. It was a solid black figure with no discernible facial features, but I could see an outline of it and it looked like a British boy from around the 1900s based on the outfit. When I looked at it, I felt the worst sense of fear and dread ever. You could tell me that I had to go drive a car over a landmine, and I wouldn't feel like this. After a few seconds, I just drifted back to sleep, and nothing occurred for the rest of the night. My most recent paranormal experience happened in August of 2019. To preface, my older cousin Charlie had passed away in late July, and his death hit my family pretty hard. It was very unexpected, and within a week of finding out, we had to drive nine hours to North Carolina for the wake and funeral, stay two nights and then drive nine more hours back home. It was truly one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through. Earlier in the year, the rest of my family had planned a trip to Portugal that very same week that we ended up having to go to our cousin's funeral. Since the trip had been planned so in advance and the death was so sudden, they were unable to cancel the trip. So a few days after the 18 hour round trip to North Carolina, my family packed up to go to Portugal and visit our grandmother. I, however, was not going on the trip with them. I had to stay home and take care of our cat. He has this medical condition that we have to keep up with him every day, and we didn't want to have to ask another family member to watch him for 10 days while we were gone. So I ended up staying with him home alone in our five bedroom, three story house for about a week and a half with my cat. With everything that happened within those two weeks prior to my family leaving, I was not in a great headspace, so I was quote unquote self-medicating with the green stuff. My parents don't really know that I'm a stoner, so with my entire family being gone, I was able to smoke freely in my backyard for most of the days and relax with my cat. One night I was sitting in bed and decided to smoke a little bit in my bedroom before I went to sleep, which I never really did in the house. Since my family was still going to be gone for a few days, I figured the smell would have dissipated by the time they got home. I smoked a small bowl and just went to bed as normal. A little before 5am, I was awoken to a loud banging in my room. My eyes shot open, and I looked around the room but saw nothing. Thoughts were racing through my head. What was in my room? Was it somewhere else in the house? Maybe it was my cat that knocked something over in the hallway. Or was it another animal? We've had some squirrels in the attic recently, but wouldn't I also hear little animal feet scratching? I heard nothing. My room was silent. My heart was absolutely pounding, and after maybe 45 minutes of wanting to either see or hear something else, exhaustion hit me, and I fell back asleep until the morning. When I woke up, the next morning, I look around my room to see if I could find the source of the sound. I find on my floor a heavy, 
hardwood cover book that had been displayed on my bookshelf that had fallen off the shelf, which was at least six feet above the ground. In my 20 years of living in that house, I've never had anything so concrete and unexplainable happen to me. The book had been placed standing up on its side with at least three inches from the edge of the shelf. I had had it sitting there for at least three years and it hadn't moved at all. The shelf was perfectly level and was not any slant forward. There also wasn't any opening that I could visibly see where an animal could have gotten in. In the days prior to this happening, I hadn't even gone over the area of my room or moved things around. I showed my dad, who was a complete skeptic, what happened after my family got home from the trip, and he really couldn't explain it. The words, maybe it was a ghost, even escaped his mouth. The rest of my family is not and never have been interested in the paranormal. I'm sort of the odd one out. Growing up in that regard, I did have an imaginary friend, the name of which happened to be the previous homeowner of the house who had passed away. I had a very minor paranormal experience while in middle school, seeing some orbs in my bedroom, and just the general feeling of being watched. The feelings sort of went away as I got older, but my sister, who would sometimes stay in my room while I was away at college, would tell me it felt like there were eyes on her when she would sleep. I guess I just got used to it as I got older. My dad was a United States Navy helicopter pilot for 20 years. He was stationed on a number of aircraft carriers and had been all over the world. He had a lot of stories, but this one is my favorite. Many years ago, the ship my dad was stationed on was granted a night of shore leave in Tokyo. The next day when the ship was supposed to leave, it was delayed because one of the sailors wasn't accounted for. Turns out he was in a Tokyo jail. The sailor had gotten blackout drunk and on his stumble back had spotted something in a very expensive BMW he decided he needed. He broke the window with his bare hands, bloodying it severely. At this point, he must have decided he needed to clean up because he somehow opened a fire hydrant with no obvious tools. He was picked up by Tokyo police sitting on the curb with a bloody arm next to a broken in car and gushing water. Lucky for him, Japan had a cooperative agreement with the US Navy, where they let the Navy deal with these things internally, and he was quickly turned over to the ship and finally left. He was asked what it was that he was trying to get from the car, and also how he managed to open the hydrant. Unfortunately, he couldn't remember a thing about the entire incident. Go figure. I delivered pizzas briefly for Little Caesar's Pizza in the very early noughties, being 19 or 20 at the time, and from the waspy suburbs, I had a lot to learn about how people on the other side of the tracks lived. I got a delivery to a particularly seedy Flophouse Motel. Two of the $5 pepperoni pizzas that usually get paid for with $11, so not really worth delivering, but it was maybe two to three miles away and I could be back quickly, and I'd be able to get out of the store, so win-win. I pull up to the hotel, and after a bit of wandering around, I find the room the customer was in. A man of maybe 55 to 60 years answered the door with no shirt on, and his entire torso covered in a bandage that had an ominous-looking stain seeping through. He invited me into the room. I set the pizzas down, and as he was paying me, he told me that he had come to the city from some other state to have a medical procedure. After I get my $11 from the pizza, he asks me if I can help him change his pus-soaked bandages. No thanks, sir. Have a good night. 